Welcome, everyone. Love having you. Great to be here. What's new with Sovereign? Uh, lots going on with Sovereign. We are gearing up for a whole bunch of uh, cool uh, releases. Um, so perpetual swaps are coming. Maybe even more exciting than that, uh, Bitcoin backed stable coins. Maybe even more exciting than that, zero interest loans uh, collateralized by Bitcoin. So perpetual loans never need to sell your Bitcoin again. Um, and uh, and then a whole bunch of infrastructure improvements like fast uh, on and off ramps. Um, so up until now we have only had fast on ramps but not fast off ramps. Lightning network integration. We're looking to bring stable coins to Lightning network. Um, yeah, so a lot of a lot of stuff. It's going to be an exciting two quarters. I think the the first half of this coming year. Whoa, the future's bright. Future's bright. Yep, future's bright indeed. Uh, okay, I think we can start, and whoever is not here will join us in a bit. I see we already have a couple hundred, getting close to three hundred here. Um, very very in the beginning, so. Looks like it's going to be a very good space to end this year. So we all gathered here today to summarize, uh, reflect, and make some conclusions ahead of the next year of what we've been through in Bitcoin. This has been a tremendous year, obviously, uh, for all of us. Um, everything in crypto has grown. We had a bull market, some would say. We are still in a bull market. Um, and a lot of new innovation has come up. Uh, I don't want to uh, speak too much today. We have so many guests and I want to give them the proper stage. Uh, so perhaps just a small introduction. Uh, we know uh, you're very popular guys, but you know, just for the people who haven't met you yet, maybe Iago, Scott, uh, Dennis, Anita, Alcon Daily, perhaps present yourself, guys. Uh, you, you know, choose your order. Um, I can... Maybe you choose the order for us. Okay. Oh, yeah, go. of course, you'll go first um, as the one who organized this entire event. And uh, thanks for that. So go ahead. Cool. So, yeah, I'm very excited to uh, be here. I'm, uh, I'm Iago. Uh, I've uh, been hardcore freedom Bitcoin maximalist for a long time. I um, was working in neuroscience. Uh, in 2011 and because i was reading papers in machine learning um i came across the bitcoin net network white paper and it screwed up my entire life i've been all bitcoin ever since and um i've yeah bitcoin's been an incredibly crazy ride but this year has to have been maybe maybe the craziest so far yeah Yep, definitely. Um, okay, thank you very much, Iago. Um, Scott, the wolf of all streets, uh, if you are in a quiet location, perhaps introduce yourself a bit. Not yet there. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Altcoin Daily, uh, since you are obviously here, uh, go ahead, Aaron, for, uh, introduce yourself. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? Yeah, my name is Aaron from Altcoin Daily. Uh, long time lurker with Bitcoin Twitter Spaces, first time uh, speaker. So, so great to great to be here. They say you always remember your first. So, you know, it's a memorable memorable spaces for me. But, uh, <laughs> but as far as uh, my Bitcoin journey, I was you know dabbled in Bitcoin and crypto in late 2016. Throughout 2017, I went full time. 2018, when we started the channel, me and my brother, and uh, we cover the the. Bitcoin and crypto news on a daily basis, news and opinion. Uh, you know, we're just regular guys in the space and our channel is uh, for uh, regular guys and, uh, you know, huge Bitcoin proponent, huge crypto enthusiast. Amazing, amazing. And I saw you guys are nearing 1 million followers on Twitter. So uh, congrats. Uh, that's an amazing achievement. Uh, I know you're just, you know, uh, it's an amazing milestone. So congrats on that. Um, Anita, perhaps uh, introduce yourself, your book, your podcast. Okay. Uh... Hey, no, sorry. Here I am. I was on <laughs> mute. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, one of my first Twitter spaces, too. Um, I'm into Bitcoin since early 2017 uh, when I heard about the possibilities for the, uh, like the, the positive effects on the human, humanitarian cause that Bitcoin can support. 
And um, I was long in web design and e-commerce projects and things like that. And that was maybe like a, a click moment for me, you know, like, wow, yeah, Bitcoin, that's the thing. I want to do something there. And from then on, I, yeah, worked myself like um, into becoming an educator in the space and a podcaster. And yeah, thanks to Sovereign, I was able to uh, publish a new book this year called Learn Bitcoin with L in a bracket. And uh, it's available now in English, German and Spanish, which I think is fantastic. And it was a fantastic year for me. And I hope uh, we can do uh, much more together in the next year. Amazing, Anita. I hope so, too. Okay. Um, Dennis, you here with us? Dennis Porter. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Thanks for having me up on stage. Uh, yeah, I've, just my story. I first heard about Bitcoin in 2017. Uh, the idea of banking the unbanked really spoke to me. Uh, I was very fortunate in the beginning to come across Andreas pretty quickly in my journey. After my friend told me about Bitcoin, I, I just went all in, couldn't stop thinking about it. Very similar to Andreas's story, just, you know, my family's thinking I'm going crazy. They start mining in my basement, uh, kept mining until my own partner was willing to kick me out because there was too many miners down there. She's like, all right, you've gone totally insane. I have to make an ultimatum. Well, I stopped mining, but I never stopped reading, learning, talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> Eventually, when uh, when uh, 2019 hit, I was really starting to build up my knowledge and understanding to a level that enabled me to start speaking about it. So when Clubhouse launched, I got in on um, very early, very early at the beginning of 2021 was when I really started to talk about Bitcoin and just spent hundreds of hours on there. Eventually, when Twitter Spaces launched, uh, came over here almost immediately just because of the the idea of the social graph combined with the power of Clubhouse. I'd seen it before with Instagram, the way they stole stories from Snapchat. So I figured, you know what, I'm going to go over there and and go where the uh, uh, the best platform is with the most amount of people. So I've been speaking over here, but also launched my podcast, Smart People Shit, where I have some of the smartest people in the Bitcoin space onto my show to talk. Um, and I spend a lot of my time now also um, working in Bitcoin and politics. So, uh, about well, back in July, maybe June, I woke up and said to myself, you know, I'm tired of all my friends and cool Bitcoiners moving away to cool cities like Miami and Austin and El Salvador. I made the distinct decision that, uh, I'm going to fight to make sure that my city of Portland, Oregon is a part of the future and not the past. So, I decided to start helping to pr promote pro-Bitcoin politicians. So I, I'm a big, big proponent. Uh, and I help Erica Rhodes on her journey towards defeating Brad Sherman. And I also work really hard to ensure that members of the uh, Bitcoin mining industry, Bitcoin space, have a voice in Congress. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> that's such an amazing work. Uh, and I didn't expect such a long intro. You're I mean, it's so much. Um, uh, thank you very much. And I, I just, you know, just, you know, I'm a hardcore listener of this podcast. So keep doing great, great work, Dennis. Uh, thank you. Thanks. And Wolf. What's, What's up, up, guys? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was having some uh, connectivity issues, but uh, I'm here now. Uh, yeah, my name is Scott Melker. Uh, I was actually a DJ and music producer for about uh, 20 years after graduating school. Uh, and through, but always was uh, superficially interested in finance and trading. So I kind of actually came in a different way than most people. I came in because it was this uh, mythical land of unicorn 100x pumps in 2016. And, you know, I was trading Forex and stocks, which were really boring when I found out about crypto. And then I sort of actually backed into the importance and in, in use case, which, of, of course, I got, you know, orange filled like everyone else and became a very passionate supporter. I'm also just basically a massive Yago fan. Uh, who I've had on my podcast twice, and we've obviously hung out in, in Miami and stuff. So that that's just a huge part of it. Is a, a bit a huge supporter of Sovereign uh, from the very beginning. I think he's a uh, in, inspirational story uh, to say to say the least. And I think that uh, what we're building here is is extremely important. So you know, I I literally started in music. I uh, 
alienated everyone who was already following me on Twitter when I just started randomly talking about this magic internet money and, you know, they all started unfollowing me. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, for some reason, for some reason there, it sort of clicked and, uh, you know, I started the podcast and the YouTube channel all after that. Basically spend, uh, you know, 24 seven, just talking shit about Bitcoin and crypto, like, like most of us here. Cool, cool stuff. I'm, I'm just now pinning um, one of these uh, talks that you had uh, that we made a recap from this and Alcon Daily, which got to an amazing video about how Bitcoin is permover and going to see it on the top here in just a second. Um, I see we have Aaron Van Weerden here, editor-in-chief of Bitcoin Magazine. Would you like to say a word? Hey, what's up? Yeah, my name is Arif Verim. I'm indeed the uh, editor-in-chief of Bitcoin Magazine, the print version, which we relaunched recently. Uh, I also co-host a technical podcast called Bitcoin Explained. Thank you very much, Aaron. Love to have you here. Um, okay, so I think we've uh, been through most of the people who are here. I see we have also uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, guests, you know, people from the audience want to ask your questions and we will open this for questions later on. I'm writing down the names of everyone who wants to ask a question by the order of your request. So don't you worry if you stick with us, you will get to ask your questions, obviously based on the time that our lovely guests here have. Uh, but I guess we'll be here for at least an hour or two. So stick with us uh, and make sure that you follow us on uh, Twitter, obviously, Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, you follow our news channel on uh, Telegram at Sovereign Announcements and join our community group at Sovereign Bitcoin. And obviously, join our Discord where you can ask all of your questions about Sovereign. And that's also where we hold our bi weekly community meetings. So just go to our website, sovereign.app, check out the link at the bottom of the page and join the Discord community. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get notified of our new videos by clicking the bell. Okay. So moving on to our next part, I want you guys to speak and perhaps we can do, make it like an open uh, debate. Um, like what are your uh, best and worst Bitcoin moments in 2021? Um, Yago, perhaps you can start and then you guys can turn along. Well, I mean, I think there's been a huge number of things that have happened this year uh, in Bitcoin and for Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> look, I think for a long time, um, I've been, um, sort of drumming, uh, you know, uh, the beat to the fact that we need to, uh, become less narrow-minded in our maximalism. I think this year there was a big change in the way that, uh, the Bitcoin community has started talking about, about. Uh, Bitcoin maximalism, Bitcoin toxicity. That's a very, very important cultural change. And I think it's a big healing uh, moment for us after uh, the trauma of the of the block size wars. Uh, after that, you know, we've had the first big release since um, since uh, Segway, right? We introduced Taproot. That's huge. And it was smooth and it was... You know, the community came together around it. it was, that, that was a very, very big deal. I think also another really big deal is what we've been seeing happening um, outside of Bitcoin in the crypto space. You know, um, we've been, uh, you know, seeing multiple different chains gaining very significant traction. Several chains have more users and more user activity than Ethereum right now. And yet, despite the fact that we've seen this massive growth, um, it's only made the unique proposition of Bitcoin as the most reliable uh, store of value, the most reliable uh, reserve currency of the space more obvious. It's become like we've got this whole industry of things that have started out trying to compete with Bitcoin, and yet none of them um, really do. They only compete with each other. So that's a really interesting thing that we've learned. And then, of course, of course, we had Elon Musk uh, and Tesla buy. We had Michael Saylor and his constant purchases. Um, and then, you know, we had a nation state adopt Bitcoin. But for me, the biggest thing this year um, is the fact that um, the hypothetical use case 
of Bitcoin as unmanipulable money has suddenly became obvious to everyone. Like the meme of the year was brrr, right? The money printer. Everyone <laughs> now knows that fiat is fake. Uh, it's not just us. It's not just that we're a bunch of crazy people. Um, the danger is real. It's imminent. It's here. And I think that changes everything. Um, anyone want to chime in? Aaron? We're talking yeah. about maximalism? We're talking <laughs> <No>. uh, <laughs> Among <yeah>. other things. <laughs> okay. I think that, like, I, I do agree with Yago that there's been a ton of positive news, as always, in the Bitcoin space, but it's picked up pretty dramatically, I think, this last year, especially as more and more people are paying attention to the hard supply cap, the 21 million versus the infinite money that can be printed out of the Fed. I think that's really the biggest story. When I talk to my friends and family, the average person out there, they immediately understand what 21 million means. Like they, they understand the significance of a money that can't be debased. I used to talk about it all the time, but I thought it was such an incredible feature, but the average person out there just really isn't paying that hard of attention like all of us in here who are just you know, obsessed and so far down the rabbit hole, we've lost sight of the entry, right? But I, I think that there's so many other things that I really get excited about as well, which is what happened in El Salvador near the beginning of the year. Incredible news. Oddly enough, my parents had lived there for seven years. So I had a unique experience of not only getting to hear about what's going on on the ground, but it was a weird way for me to Bitcoin like rebuilt my relationship with my family. Uh, we hadn't been talking for some time. They're, you know, they're missionaries down there. I left the church quite a while ago. So it's just been cr crazy to see how Bitcoin is changing that country, but also somehow magically um, it's bringing relationships back together. Uh, the China exodus was huge, massive. I think that was another um, big story for the maybe more like institutional type investors out there who wanted to see the resiliency of this network and they got to see it in full display. Now Bitcoin has left China as far as the mining is concerned and the United States is number one in Bitcoin mining. So I'm super pumped about that. As someone who's a very big proponent of making sure that we keep Bitcoin in the USA, I think having the industry here is, is a big, big part of that. And so the more mining that comes here, the less likely we ban it in my perception. Uh, Taproot was big. And then just my big story, which I, I I've touched on a couple times here, was just the Bitcoin and politics. I, that's my huge focus. It's something that I'm very passionate about. I work not only on the local level in my state, but also on the federal level with various campaigns all across the country. And when I first jumped into Bitcoin and politics, I thought, I'm going to get eviscerated. This is a bunch of anti-state, anti-government folks who could care less about voting. And I think that still is true to some extent with a lot of the people in the community. But some of us who are in the United States and have deep roots, we have homes, we have businesses, we have families. Um, you know, I have a family member that lives uh, in, in my home in the ADU, right? We take care of my family member. So I'm not going anywhere. I don't really have the option to go anywhere. I think if something crazy were to happen, I could get put in a situation where I'm having to make a decision between Bitcoin, um, keeping my Bitcoin or moving out of the country, which is a decision that I don't want to make. And I think a lot of Americans woke up across the country after the crypto tax reporting amendment and said, I don't want to make that decision either. Let's put pressure on the government. Let's put pressure on the politicians. So it's been really fun to watch as Americans and non-Americans all across the world have stood up and said that we want Bitcoin to stay in the United States. So we want it to be a Bitcoin country. We want it to be like El Salvador. Uh, we've had senators get up on the Senate fucking floor, excuse my language, and say, thank God for Bitcoin. I mean, who would have thought that would happen last year alone? Like we have senators standing up and saying, I'm going to write a bill that is in favor of Bitcoin and that protects Bitcoin. I mean, Senator Lummis has a bill right now that she's about to put out. And so it's just, you know, obviously, as you can tell, pretty excited. Uh, I think a lot of things are coming for Bitcoin in the USA, and I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future. Yeah, I definitely can echo what uh, Dennis said and take something from Yago. Right before he said it, I was going to say sort of the story that we don't uh, still talk about as much was definitely the infrastructure bill and the sort of riptide that came after that, which was really surprising to me, actually. I mean, Yago and I have talked about this at length before. 
I'm definitely a pretty outspoken voice against maximalism. I mean, I believe that maximalism uh, definitely got us as far as we are. Bitcoin maximalists have been essential to the story and we would not be here without them. But for me, maximalism of any kind in life is toxic in general, right? It's just sort of like stunted growth. But I believe that was a big problem in the community until the infrastructure bill, because when the infrastructure bill came out and there was this one line that threatened the crypto industry, everybody from every single community dropped their maximalism immediately and came together to fight that in the name of the entire crypto community. And that was something that I would not have expected without a lobby, without a PAC, without any really political, political uh, sway. It was just the people who believed in this coming out and speaking against it. And I, I don't think it can be understated how insane it is that the crypto community effectively froze the infrastructure bill, the biggest bill of the Biden administration for four days because of one sentence that some intern probably wrote in there as an afterthought as a way to raise more taxes. Right. So as much as we're obviously uh, it was a bit of a downer that the bill went through with the language and that that all happened because one old man in Alabama didn't like that his defense spending wasn't in there after there was a basically a compromise that was reached. I think now you have this grand awakening across politics that you might lose your job if you don't have a position on crypto. And that's not something I would have ever imagined. I mean, I think call me a cynic, but we all know at the end of the day that 99% of the politicians who represent us give a shit about one thing and that's getting reelected. Right. And so crypto has never been a threat to that, uh, to the idea of them getting reelected until now. So I think now we all know that, hey, if we call our senators, we call our Congress people, we call our local politicians, as Dennis was sort of uh, touching on. I think that's extremely powerful, letting them know that our voice will be heard and that to a very large degree now, I think people in crypto have become one issue voters. Right. And that's not a one issue voter that they expected. So now with the threat of either losing their job or the promise of gaining votes from this community that basically has been unheard and unrepresented in politics is absolutely huge. And that might pan out to be the biggest story that we have this entire year. Jump in. Uh, yeah. I mean, like what the what the wolf and Dennis said, I echo that. Um, if I'm thinking back to like the biggest, most impactful things of 2021 for me, I mean, I guess just to preface it, I think like the biggest things that happened in 2020, as I remember, besides the, you know, the pandemic scare, we had Paul Tudor Jones, Raul Paul as two like huge investors, hedge fund managers, throw their support for Bitcoin. Also, that was the year that Michael Saylor uh, first publicly traded company, put Bitcoin on its balance sheet. And then I remember thinking at the beginning of the year, you know, what could possibly happen in 2021? And I was pretty bullish, but we really just had a continuation of that with uh, Elon Musk, you know, doing what Michael Saylor did only, you know, more, more celebrity attached to it. Um, other things in 2021, uh, the, the very beginning, we had that game stock short squeeze. And um, I think, you know, that was a time when a lot of people, because Robin Hood, like made people so they could only sell, they couldn't buy. I think that was it. And I, I think a lot of people realized, you know, how much these uh, centralized entities are kind of like effing us over and just, you know, uh, doing things for, uh, you know, people who are pulling the strings. I think that was a really big moment. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, get people tuned in to what Bitcoin can do. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Elon Musk, basically, you know, he says a lot of things, but watch what they do, not what they say. And he's still holding, you know, over a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And of course, El Salvador, Bitcoin adoption, huge can't be understated. I mean, people used to, people used to, you know, four years ago and even before, um, people used to just, you know, dream that a publicly traded company or, or Elon Musk would put Bitcoin on their balance sheet or a small country would start using it as their money. So, uh, you know, huge momentum uh, we've gained in 2021, plus the China crackdown uh, on uh, Bitcoin miners, which um, ultimately I think it's, you know, pretty good for Bitcoin. Um, it, you know, it's not really a surprise, but, uh, it reduces China's ability to potentially influence Bitcoin, which wasn't very likely, but now they can't. Uh, it's great for Bitcoin's carbon footprint because China had heavily uh, coal powered uh, Bitcoin mining and uh, it didn't really affect the security and Bitcoin's hash rate is uh, is back. So uh, that, along with inflation, those are all the things that I can pick out for 2021, which is, which was huge. Of course, you know, as far as uh, toxic, uh, toxic maximalism, I can I 
consume more Bitcoin only content than, uh, you know, I think most people. So I'm, you know, pretty in tune with all the maximalist arguments. I think it's like really, you know, it wasn't that great for, uh, you know, getting changing people's hearts and minds, in my opinion, in 2021. And it's crazy, like almost everything Udi has said this year, I, I tend to agree with. So it's, uh, you know, it's good to see everybody finding more common ground in that regard and everybody coming together. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more uh, on the fact of, of China. Uh, all they did the stupidest move uh, any any nation could do with, with regards to Bitcoin. I mean, the, the the strongest part of Bitcoin, in my one of the strongest parts of Bitcoin, is its game theory. And China just, uh, unless there's something we don't know, China just blew their whole cards out. And for for the world, that's obviously the best move uh, for them. That was the stupidest move they could ever do. Um, and yeah, that's, I guess, my favorite moment. Um, okay, uh, do you have any more uh, on that or would we I, continue? Maybe, maybe we I, should let Big Al introduce himself also and then Anita. Um... Hey, uh, this is Big Al. Um, great to be on. Uh, thanks for putting this together, Yago and Sovereign. Um, just my background, I got into Bitcoin around 2014 and, uh, it was from game theory research I was doing, um, sort of been under the radar, but obsessed with the industry since then. Um, not to fully dox myself, but I work at a traditional fund where I, I run their, uh, crypto division, quote unquote. And I also help with a Bitcoin miner here in the United States uh, as we uh, rapidly scale that out. And when I think about 2021 on the narratives that everyone's talking about, there is simply no doubt that um, it's been a hugely positive year for Bitcoin and the industry. A lot of attention, a lot of uh, knowledge, content being put out and money put into the space. Um, and I think that one of the reasons Alan Farrington and I wrote our paper, Only the Strong Survive, is just with excitement, there can be some dangers. And I think that what we see in the positives and the growth in a lot of quote unquote DeFi, um, it's also important to make sure that people coming into the space are protected. And, um, you know, we, we continue to, we don't need to, I always hated the legislation thing where, you know, oh, let's ban other chains or anything like that. Let's regulate them. I, I don't like, I think that eventually value will flow to where value is. Um, and net net, that's um, sort of how I view 2021. It's just making sure to continue educating people um, on the space and let them make their own decisions. Yes, I would like to add something on the growth. Uh, the growth in Bitcoin, I um, on the useful Tulip site at the moment, and it's fascinating to see that in the last year. There was a huge gain in uh, Bitcoin trading volume on Paxful and local Bitcoins combined in uh, Asia and Africa. And uh, while we see in Europe and Australia and North America, it's a little bit of a loss and a, smart, uh, a small gain also in South America. And I find it very interesting to see uh, what will come in the next years in Africa. I think we'll see a lot of adoption coming from there. Uh, also, what I'm very excited about is the growth of the Lightning Network, um, not only in, the mean, in, in transactions or payments in the number, but also in the liquidity that's in the Lightning Network now. And I think we'll see some great developments there, like um, how people all, of the, all, all over the world will be able to earn Bitcoin over the Lightning Network permissionless and globally for their work um, as a podcaster, as a YouTuber, for writing content and things like that. And I'm very excited about that. Yep, I agree. Um, it's truly exciting. Um, and, you know, with every year uh, that, that I'm in the space, it, it just gets more and more exciting and more and more interesting and more and more real, right? The, the thing that was just uh, an idea a few years ago is now changing the entire world. And it's truly amazing. I think maybe we'll give, Yago, yeah, unless you want to say something, maybe we'll give. Yeah, like... I just wanted to say, like listening to this entire list, like we've just spent like 30 minutes on all of the amazing things that happened just this year in Bitcoin. 
And it's just every single one of them, you know, El Salvador, Tesla, Taproot, uh, 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 um, Halting Congress, uh, Growth of the Lightning Network, you know, or every single one of them in and of itself would be a big story. It just made me realize that, you know, wow, Bitcoin's super undervalued. <laughs> That's for sure. That's a hundred percent. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, Dennis, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to comment one last time on something that Scott had said, which I thought was very, very interesting, is this idea of the people in crypto generally and the Bitcoin only people such as myself, like almost like working across the aisle to help to ensure that Bitcoin is protected in the USA. And, you know, we have different um, motivations. There's me protecting Bitcoin. There is the crypto space protecting the crypto space. But it is a fascinating uh, time in history to see that there is some potential. I'm not saying that we're all going to walk off, <laughs> in, you know, into sunshine and rainbows for the rest of history. But a common enemy does make interesting bedfellows. And I'm uh, very curious to kind of see how history plays out as we continue down this path of temporarily, albeit temporary unity. Okay, just... Yeah. Sorry, Scott. Scott. Um, just connecting to us. Um, a person that would... I guess his English is not that good, so he probably won't, won't like to speak so much. Uh, but he's a person who really influenced me and a lot of people um, in Israel. Uh, he has an incredibly famous video uh, explaining Bitcoin in 2014. Uh, and his, I can't explain how influential he was uh, on my Bitcoin journey. So uh, perhaps you'd want to introduce, introduce yourself, Hamal Moon. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm in Bitcoin from uh, early 2013. Um, pretty much uh, known in the Israeli community. Uh, I just want to say uh, to all of you, Bitcoin Liberté, now, uh, it was an unbelievable year. I think the focus should be on South America and the black community in the United States. I think we should all shout that dollar is a scam. It's a shit coin. It's a Ponzi. And Bitcoin is liberty. And... Uh, Thank you all, Iago, and everyone else in the, making it possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Amamul, as always, right on, right on point. Um, okay, Scott, you wanted to say something. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to echo back to what, what Dennis was talking about. You know, obviously, he sort of alluded to the fact that we have this, I guess, temporary peace among the communities because we have a common enemy, which, as he said, makes a strange bedfellows. And I think it's, you know, we obviously have talked about all the amazing things that have happened in 2021, but I think it's also important to note that in a lot of those cases, we haven't seen the follow through that I think a lot of us expected. So we need to continue pushing pretty hard into the coming years. Obviously, you know, in June, we were all at the Bitcoin convention. We saw Jack get up on stage and, and announce the El Salvador news. We haven't seen another country uh, adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Not saying that we should have expected it, but we haven't. In August of 2020, MicroStrategy put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Uh, we saw Tesla do that at the beginning of the year. We saw a huge conference MicroStrategy hosted with almost 2,000 CFOs. None of them have publicly added Bitcoin to the balance sheet. Now, we can get into the reasons that that happened. I actually spoke yesterday with Eric Weiss, who is the guy that orange-pilled Michael Saylor, he said that's a result they've seen of the tax code. Basically, gap tax laws say that a company puts something on their balance sheet that at the end of the quarter, the lowest point that that price ever was is the one that counts against their earnings. And that's why companies haven't done that. So we need to change in the tax code. But all these huge events, 
I think in 2022, they become blips and almost meaningless if we don't see follow through from other companies, other cities. I mean, we haven't even talked about what Miami has done, which was ahead of El Salvador and arguably bigger in some ways. But if we don't see follow through from more cities, more countries, more companies, it will become sort of an afterthought. Like, you know, I was one of the first people I was talking about the fact the El Salvador news is absolutely incredible, but it has to work. Right. Because it's one of those things that it happening alone isn't enough. We need to see it succeed. If it fails, we won't see other countries do that. So I think the onus is on all of us to actually not get lazy and not get complacent and to push very hard to make sure that we see these things continue to happen. I couldn't agree with you more. You start the best, you, you start the fast you can, and then you slowly speed up. Um, okay, uh, I think uh, we can move on to the next part. Maybe uh, since this, this is a Twitter space and not just a shitty podcast, let's uh, get someone from our audience, maybe a question or two. <laughs> Dennis, I'm joking, obviously. Uh, let's get a question or two from our audience um, because we can. So, uh, Lee, honey, you were first. Okay, you're up the stage go ahead shoot your question muted okay um mm, 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 mm. next one on the list is bitcoin boise i hope you're ready if this doesn't go we'll move on with our agenda bitcoin boise do you want to ask your question um yeah i wanted to know what you guys think um web for gaming would be like Web four? Do we have web? Do we have web three yet? Yeah, we have web three. That's why I'm seeing if you guys, well, what you guys would think on a web four gaming. I think web three is uh, exciting, but like right now, it's like you know, there's just the promise of what 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 web three is going to be. Right. Uh, so what web four could be, you know, could be anything. Right. Perhaps it would be nice to introduce yourself, Bitcoin Boys, because I see in your bio that you're 12 years old, but you know a lot about crypto. That's that's amazing, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew anything Let's about crypto when I was 12 years old. Okay, so basically, yes, it's true. I am a 12-year-old who was investing in crypto, and I do know a lot about crypto. Basically, what I do is I'm trying to teach kids my age more about crypto. Amazing. Amazing. Keep up the good work. Well, I, yeah. I would say, uh, you know, it's up to you guys, the 12 year olds of the world, to decide what the Web 4 is going to look like. Right. I think you're going to have to build it. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, the, we're Bitcoin boomers. We, uh, you know. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts? We're, we're, so, we're just trying to get our, our heads around Web three. Bitcoin right. boy, do you have any do you have any thoughts about like Web three versus Web four? Like, what is Web three to you? Web three is like a more enhanced, well, more like it's a different version of gaming. But I think that Web four could be like even more advanced. Like right now, we have virtual reality. I think that maybe some, like, our lives could end up being virtual reality at one point. For sure. So, I think that could possibly, I think that's in the future somewhere, could fall into Web 3. I think, what, you know, Web 2 versus Web 3 to me, because, like, Web 1, I guess, was just when everybody, in the 90s, when everybody had, like, individual sites that were, like, read-only and uh, it was pretty much just brick and mortar thinking applied to the web. And then web two, everybody got connected. It could read, write and connect the rise of social media. And uh, so web three, you know, one of the things that's, you know, the promise of web three and uh, you know, who knows what it'll, what it'll turn into is, you know, more user rights, more privacy, more, uh, you know, semantic and AI driven. Um, and all that could like fall under like augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, I think regardless of whether it's web three, four or five, uh, what you're describing is definitely going to happen in the future. So, so the way I would describe Web3, I, 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 for myself, have a pretty simple definition of what web, Web3 web is. So Web, web like Web was just Web, right? Web2 was uh, the introduction of uh, the social graph. 
And to my mind, Web3 is the introduction of property rights for the internet. And to the extent that we're able to introduce property rights to the internet, which is basically being a property rights free zone, it's been like, yeah, but like a communist uh, absolutist state, right? You, you're, you, the, the, whoever controls the servers control makes the rules. I think that's what Web3 is for me. I just want to know how many people in this room were investing in tech stocks when they were 12. I think that's a pretty incredible thing that the Bitcoin crypto space does allow is that anybody has accessibility. Yeah. I was yeah. investing in my neighbor's Playboys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's changed quite a bit, hasn't it? Dennis, you probably it have strong indeed. thoughts on Web3, am I right? Who is that a question uh, directed to? Alcorn? Oh, yeah, I was uh, uh, talking to you, sir. I fe feel like you have strong, oh, strong I, thoughts. I would have strong thoughts about Web3. I actually have very uh, weak thoughts about uh, Web3. I I'm just you know here to see what happens. I think Bitcoin is going to be a big player. I think, as was stated earlier, that uh, personal property rights in the digital verse is going to be incredibly important. And I think Bitcoin is the base layer of all of that. So guys, if you're bullish on Bitcoin, we have over 700 people listening to this spaces. If you're bullish on Bitcoin, flash some emojis. Flash some emojis in the uh, in the chat. All right, all right. That's good. That's looking good. All right. Uh, Bitcoin Boise, thank you very much for joining. Keep doing an amazing work. You're going to be a billionaire. Yeah, just so you know. Yeah, you're, you're obviously going to be a billionaire one day. Um, good luck, man. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, okay. Now, uh, let's move on. I see we also have uh, two more guests who joined us to the stage. Miss Tin Crypto and El Sultan Bitcoin. Welcome, guys. Uh, love to have you here. Um, now, I'd like to ask our beloved uh, panel members, um, what are your key takeaways uh, for the year ahead of 2022? Um, maybe we'll start with the biggest surprise of 2021. Yeah, would you like to go first? Yeah, Mr. Crypto, you can go first. What was the biggest surprise of 2021? One of the biggest surprises for me was Elon Musk getting into this space and all the institutional adoption that came in. And I believe Beeple's $69 million NFT sale was one of the biggest surprises to me. And, you know, this is all because there was so much adoption in the past year and so many people questioning what is crypto, what is Bitcoin and how do all these coins vary from each other? And I saw a lot of Gen Z adoption happen over the past year, which was very amazing. And I also wanted to say hello to Bitcoin Izzy that was up here as well. He's just one of the kids that's just going to help us push this initiative. I think for me, the biggest surprise, having thought about it for a moment, um, is that we uh, aren't tracking the four-year cycle. So, you know, we didn't uh, see an exponential run-up. Uh, we haven't had a blow-off top. Um, and it might be that, you know, just the, the cycle is getting elongated, but it feels very much like things have changed uh, and we, we might not, we might be out of the four-year cycle um, process. So for me, I think that was a big, big surprise. And um, if that is the case, I think it's extremely optimistic because this whole binary feast or famine, you know, one year bull markets, two years uh, bear market and one year sort of consolidation. It was very, very difficult, I think, uh, to build businesses um, build projects, build communities around that. Um, although it did have a very, very powerful um, and big advantage of flushing out everyone who wasn't really committed over and over again. But um, having something which is a more steady uptick um, and is more manageable, I think takes us into a whole new realm in terms of um, how solid, how powerful, how important Bitcoin can be. Totally. <clears throat> For me, I mean, so many surprising things happened this year. It's been such a great year. 
with Elon Musk, like Misty and Crypto said, with the you know potential breaking of the four-year cycle, like you pointed out, Yago, with the fact that this is like the first cycle where Bitcoin and cryptocurrency truly went mainstream. Like that's really exciting, whether we're talking about institutional adoption or just people buying in or just you know getting covered in the mainstream media and independent media. I think within crypto, maybe the biggest surprise to me was just how big NFTs have taken off because, you know, it's like, you know, particularly Bitcoiners, you know, warning people, uh, you know, last year in the beginning of the year, you know, don't buy shit coins because, you know, they're illiquid. They're not worth anything. Well, you know, retail aped in and said, hey, I want something that's not liquid at all. And uh, its value is subjective and, uh, you know, it's really gaining popularity. So. And you know what, uh, old saying in Bitcoin, everything is good for Bitcoin. I think everybody coming in buying NFTs and Doge, they're learning how to, uh, you know, uh, buy and sell and transfer things with a crypto wallet. Um, I think it's ultimately really good. I think people selling an NFT for $69 million is definitely the winner. Uh, <laughs> hard to argue oh, with yeah. that one, but. You know, with I think with that as uh, as sort of the starting point, I would say, and this sort of echoes what I was saying before, like August 2020 micro strategy buys Bitcoin. I fully expected, even though obviously I believe in, in you know, Web3 and, and all of these other facets, I fully expected that the narrative of 2021 coming out of COVID and money printing and seeing the price appreciation was going to be very, very Bitcoin centric. So I have to say that I was surprised at the immediate and quick rise of NFTs to the point where one was selling for $69 million and it was a key sketch on Saturday Night Live. I, I wouldn't have uh, expected something like that to happen. But also, I mean, you know, DeFi, TVL uh, went to $240 billion, uh, you know, like 1,200% up over the year. And then Facebook rebranding to the metaverse, seeing this complete absolute rise in metaverse and again they, we talked about mainstream adoption but mainstream adoption happened largely outside of bitcoin which surprised me obviously dog coins nfts memes that was happening in the real world too with gamestop and amc but the way that we got to mainstream adoption was not necessarily the path that i expected well since a lot of the other ones that i would say have already been said a bunch of times including nfts being sold for tens of millions of dollars, which regardless of my opinion on them, uh, is just absolutely wild. One thing that was really surprising to me, a narrative that shifted is in the political side of things, we had this narrative constantly that this is a libertarian, right wing, uh, maybe Republican conservative technology. And I just never really agreed with that as someone who lives in Portland, Oregon, and has a lot of progressive friends, I've heard them talk about the way that Bitcoin aligns with their progressive values. And I think that that's a really important part of ensuring adoption in the United States. We want both sides of the aisle to be a part of this future and to see themselves as part of this Bitcoin future, because as most of us believe that it's happening regardless. So uh, a couple of things that were really big that I think change that story on a national um, and then change the national narrative is that 10 Democrats got together and signed a letter and sent it to Nancy Pelosi to tell her that they did not like the crypto tax reporting amendment and then they wanted it to be changed. And that was huge because it was 10, just 10 Democrats. You had Soto, um, you had Ro Khanna, and and these are people that, you know, this doesn't necessarily align purely with their base, right? Like supporting Bitcoin and the crypto space gets them sometimes a little bit of flack, especially because of the ESG stuff. So I think that was a huge moment. Also, just was it last night, man, I feel like I, every day is like an eternity in this space. As you as, as Yago said earlier, it's like every single story uh, is a breaking headline news story. But we had Andrew Yang, we had Cynthia Lummis, and we also had Erica Rhodes, all members of three different, totally different political parties on stage talking about Bitcoin and politics and how we make sure that the United States is in line with that future. And if you can't see how incredible that is, then 
you must have like no connection to social media, the internet or TV, because the division in this country is at an all time high, um, maybe the highest in history. I think I can think maybe the civil war would be a worse time, but it's definitely the highest it's been in our lifetimes. And to see members of separate political parties get into a room and talk about one thing and all agree, I think is a very big moment for crypto Bitcoin space, but also a very big moment for the United States and us being a part of that future. I don't want to live outside of the United States. Like I, I have to li live here. So I'm hoping we can all use this as a way to bring our country closer together and avoid some sort of even more drastic situation. Uh, I don't think we're quite ready for a civil war, but we're headed in those sorts of directions. And I'm hoping Bitcoin can be the thing that changes and course corrects us. In a way, I feel like that's what Bitcoin is for. I think, you know, for at least two decades now, it's become clear that our institutions are becoming increasingly less um, well adapted to the uh, environment in which we live in. The globalized digital environment just doesn't make sense for institutions that were created for what is effectively an industrial age. And... Uh, everything we've been experiencing, like the reduced trust in governments, the increased polarization, the tribalism between people, the uh, uh, social media bubbles are all reflections of, uh, uh, of our institutions becoming less trusted because they're less well suited to the world in which we exist. And the biggest problem has been that there's been... And everyone has been trying to offer a solution. All of these solutions have been backwards looking, right? The 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 progressive left want to go back to socialism. The uh, the conservative right want to go make America great again, and you know talk about some abstract time that never existed. Everyone's looking backwards because no one has had any imagination or any ideas or any new ideology for the future, and that's what Bitcoin does. Right. I think that's why people can come together around Bitcoin, because it's the first reimagining of what social institutions of the future could look like, of how you can create a new global jurisdiction, transparent, open and fair for everyone. And around which you can build an entire world of similar institutions. And for me, that's always been the big promise of Bitcoin. I think it's the only real reimagination we have of what a world uh, of the future rather than the world of the past can look like. All right. Sultan Bitcoin, I see you're raising your hand. Would you like to chime in? Yeah. yeah Dennis, you wanted to say something? Just was going to chime in and say I agree with what Yago said. I, um, I think that we're creating ways to move ourselves past some of the institutions of the, of the past. So it's a, I think it's a huge thing and uh, it makes me extremely bullish about the future. I can't imagine being someone who doesn't understand Bitcoin and doesn't understand the freedom that it provides and the protection that it provides. So it, it makes me extremely bullish when people figure that out, just like how when they figured out what the 21 million supply hard cap meant, like that they get that, they understand that feature, they know what it means, they see the value in it, but they they don't all quite yet see the value in permissionless money. They don't see the value in rules that can't change, that are that are you know written in code and protected by users all around the globe with their nodes. So when people find out that they can spend their money how and when and where they want digitally without permission because they're being told that they can't spend it how and where and when they want because the government has moved to CBDCs and they've decided that, oh, you know what, uh, you know, this money here is for rent and you have to spend it in the next 30 days versus this money is free and you can spend it how, when and where you want. And there's nobody that can stop you from doing it. I think that is going to be a huge shelling point for Bitcoin when the average person out there understands that valuable feature. But they're not going to understand it, I don't think, quite as well until we get into a situation where CBDs become prevalent. Um, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe we'll head towards a privatized uh, stablecoin future, which I hope, I hope we have a privatized stablecoin future that's regulated by the SEC and various members of the government over a CBDC dystopian future. Yeah, I was just going to say very quickly that 
Bitcoin, I think, is inherently apolitical. So obviously, as much as Dennis said, you would expect it to be a right versus left thing. I think that uh, we've seen over the last 20, 30 years that neither party can claim fiscal responsibility, right? They both are going to print money somewhat endlessly just to a different scale. And so you have unreasonable people on both sides who obviously believe in printing our way out of problems, which means you're going to have reasonable people on both sides who believe that that's wrong. And we'll see the value in Bitcoin. And I think that Bitcoin is a currency for sort of that post-political, apolitical world that we all all dream of. So as much as it seems like it would rationally be surprising when you really dig in, there should be people on both sides of the aisle, obviously, who believe in Bitcoin and believe that money printing is wrong. Inflation is wrong. Uh, to that end, guys, I have to actually run. I have a podcast to record in about three minutes. Just want to thank you guys. Huge fan of everything that's going on here. Loved everything uh, that you all had to say. And can't wait to do it again. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much for joining us, Scott. Uh, and I, I barely noticed, and it's almost been an hour. Uh, I guess we uh, we have at least uh, one more hour here. Let's see how our guests are feeling. Uh, I just turned out to not have any plans for tonight, so if you'd like, <laughs> uh, I'm free. Um, okay, so uh, let's take another question from the audience. Uh, guys, if I raise you to the stage, you have one chance and you shoot your question. If you don't shoot your question fast, Next one on the clip, next one on the list. Sorry, it was just so many people, and we gotta let everyone have their chance to speak. So, Jay Crypto, I don't see you here. Peter Schiller, and I don't see you here. Uh, Cameron McGregor, Cameron McGregor, where are you? You were here. Here you are. Okay. Cameron on stage. Go ahead, buddy. Ask your question. Hello, Cameron? can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, well, thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, I have two. One is I'm, I'm very bullish on the long-term future of Bitcoin, as obviously everybody on this call is. But there's a danger in that consensus in the short term. And to me, the very success of Bitcoin over the last two years, to some degree, makes it vulnerable. And that is that it has integrated into the existing financial system, which is just layered with all kinds of leverage and debt. Um, so the first question is, in the short term, as in the next year, what are the potential pitfalls for Bitcoin as an investment? And long term, do you think that Bitcoin can become a parallel financial structure, which I think is really what it should become? And the second question is regarding Ripple and the SEC lawsuit. Um, I, I've tried to follow this as closely as I can, but it just strikes me as a very odd uh, filing of uh, grievance, and I was curious what what people's thoughts were on that. And secondly, how how does this end? When does the SEC's lawsuit get resolved, and how? Thank you. Well, I think uh, for me, your concern really resonates. Um, I think there's a, a a real risk that if we don't develop strong ways for people to use Bitcoin trustlessly uh, and in, in decentralized ways that it effectively gets co-opted by the existing financial institutions and the existing financial system. And it might be that it gets co-opted by Coinbase instead of by JP Morgan. And then, but then all you end up with is Coinbase becomes the next JP Morgan. And I don't think we've accomplished very much in, in doing that. And so, I think self-custody is extremely important. I think building an economy around Bitcoin is extremely important. And doing so in a way where this can be done uh, you know, in trust-minimized ways without intermediaries is extremely important. Uh, and that's why I've gotten so excited and have become so involved with Sovereign, because I think of all of the projects that I see out there, Sovereign is, you know leading in terms of building out financial uh, economic tools and basically an economic operating system for um, tokenizing the world around Bitcoin, tying it directly to Bitcoin, using Bitcoin as the uh, reserve asset for all of that and allowing people to use their Bitcoin in various ways like trading or lending or hedging or creating Bitcoin-backed stablecoins. 
And I think that that becomes extremely important and extremely necessary. Um, and its urgency rises as we see greater adoption by, by institutional players. It's also an additional risk is that um, we know that the gold market has been significantly manipulated. Um, you know, that was always like considered a conspiracy theory of gold bugs, and I never really believed it until um, seven banks were fined for manipulating the gold market uh, and suppressing prices. Um, that becomes much easier to do if systems aren't transparent. And so if you're introducing decentralized, transparent financial systems for Bitcoin, it, it once again makes it much harder to manipulate the market. And so I think these are extremely important things if we want to defend Bitcoin both in the near term and in the long term. Um, with regards to Ripple, I, I haven't been following it that closely. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Ripple can you know, burn in a fire. But I do hope that they win the lawsuit because um, I don't particularly want to see crypto regulated by the SEC uh, in any way or form. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely can, uh, unlikely will see a parallel financial system, um, Cameron. I, 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 I used to think that, in particular, with the dollar, not just all fiat. I just used to think that we were in this hyperinflationary state all across the board. We're about to like see the dollar absolutely collapse and. Bitcoin will take over and whether that happens in five years or 10 years, um, it's going to, it's, it's coming any moment, any moment's coming. I, I've, I've actually adapted my position pretty dramatically in the last several months. I think we'll probably see something where Bitcoin and the dollar in particular survive alongside each other as other fiat currencies collapse. Um, I started looking into the dollar milkshake theory, you know, it, it's not it's not everything, but it's it's definitely an interesting approach. If you haven't heard of it, go go look it up. And there's a few podcasts about it out there. Uh, also, I think the thing that really rounded it out for me to make me realize that this is a potential future that we will likely be a part of is this idea of stable coins, privatized stable coins, um, becoming prevalent in the United States versus something like a CBDC. I think that there's a very real possibility that the U.S. government does not take on the mantle of trying to go down this CBDC path uh, for a couple reasons. The the biggest one is that uh, governments are really, really bad at doing these sorts of things. And I think that it's likely to fail um, and have a lot of problems. It would be better for them to allow the private industry to, to do this sort of thing, which is typically what the U.S. government likes to do. They like to fund and seed private industry. I mean, look at what the way they protect and boost the work of Elon Musk. Um, you know, he, he is a private industry yet at the same time, you know, he can't hire people to work on rockets outside the country. Why? Because to some extent, the U S government is in bed with him. I think the same thing will happen with the stablecoin industry to a certain extent, but what you'll see is as the crypto space, whatever chain it's on, it could be on, you know, some, you know, any chain, or it could be on like something like a liquid side chain type situation or whatever. Bitcoiners. I don't even know what we're calling liquid at this point, but it's some to me, it's some version of a of a side chain. Um, I'm not sure the exact terminology that we want to use for it. So don't nail me to the wall on using the wrong word. But the premise would be that it won't be on directly the Bitcoin main chain because that's you know too secure, uh, not enough block space. But you'll see the proliferation of stable coins across the world as the average person out there, the normal person, in every country now has access to whatever fiat currency they wish to have access to because this is a permissionless system. And so you'll see people in Venezuela, you'll see people in Turkey and various other countries theoretically say, wake up one day and say, hey, you know, my, my currency is failing dramatically. And I like this Bitcoin thing for saving money, but it's not really good for, you know, buying groceries the next day or, or for saving for, you know, to make sure I can pay rent at the end of the month. What if it drops like 30 or 40%? So you'll see people go to the thing that they know best, which is the US dollar. 
via something like a USDT or DC. And they'll start to use that as their currency or their medium exchange. And combined with the ideas around the dollar milkshake theory and the proliferation of stable coins, I think you'll see a, um, a strengthening of the US dollar against other fiat, not against Bitcoin or crypto necessarily, but against uh, other fiat out there. And all these other fiats will collapse. The dollar will strengthen and Bitcoin will strengthen. And those will be parallel systems for a while until Bitcoin eventually gets stable as well, which will be 30, probably 40 years in the future. And then most people will begin start to begin moving into Bitcoin as their medium of exchange and unit of account. Sorry, that was a little long winded, but um, I, I thought that was a it was a great question from you, Cameron, and wanted to deliver the whole point. Yeah, no, I really, really appreciate it. And, um, you know, if, if I may just add one other structural concern I have is um, I read yesterday or recently that about 27 percent of uh, the Bitcoin supply is held by 0.01 percent of the investment community in Bitcoin to date, uh, meaning a very small number of folks, whomever they may be, own a lot of it. Um, that concerns me. But perhaps it's a Pareto distribution and maybe that was inevitable anyway. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, Bitcoin has the best Gini coefficient out of any cryptocurrency, meaning it's like the most distributed. Um, there's certainly, you know, in all cryptocurrency and even Bitcoin, there's room to get more distributed as time goes on. I mean, it is still fairly early. But I think that statistic, and maybe somebody else can jump in, I think that statistic was taking into account like the centralized entities that control a lot for many people like like Coinbase. Yep. Yeah, like when people talk about, I mean, let's compare apples to apples here. Like what are you comparing Bitcoin to? You should be comparing it to the current system. And in the current system, wealth is becoming more centralized over time. So you'll see, what is it like? the top 1% owns like 50% of the world, wealth of the world. I mean, that's incredibly insane. And it's getting worse as time goes on. Whereas like in the Bitcoin space, it's getting better as time goes on. From the very beginning of when Bitcoin was created till now, the wealth has become more and more distributed and that trend has never broken. And I don't think it will break anytime soon. Delve down into Bitcoin's best and worst moments and takeaways for the next year. Um, let's get into a bit more specifics into uh, what's uh, relevant for our our home field, uh, we can call it, uh, which is DeFi on Bitcoin. Uh, so what would you guys say about DeFi on Bitcoin or, or DeFi for Bitcoin status, uh, where we're at and where are we heading uh, for 2022? Yago should probably start on this one. Obviously. Well, yeah. So, uh, you know, this is something I think about a lot. Uh, for me, look, I, I, we've made a huge amount of progress uh, over the last uh, six months, right? So Sovereign uh, launched um, in April. Um, there were other uh, projects that sought to bring um, decentralized trading um and and other kinds of financial tools to bitcoin previously you know like really cool things like bisque for example but nothing um has grown in the way that bitcoin uh sorry in the way that sovereign has grown right so it's done um over one and a half billion dollars in transactions over the last six months of which uh half a billion were in the last six weeks um yeah, there's been over uh, you know, $1.3 billion on the system at any given time, you know, like that have been moved into the side chain. And so what it is, it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of Bitcoin developers who have in, in, worked together um, a whole bunch of tooling, Bitcoin Layer 2 tooling that has been built over the years, so rootstock for side chains, Lightning Network integrating now with Taproot to increase the peg uh, uh, trustlessness. Um, and, and, and the community has been extremely enthusiastic and growing very, very fast. And I think has brought, uh, you know, an entirely new way of thinking about how we can build on Bitcoin um, to the Bitcoin space. And in addition to that, we've also seen 
uh, traction with stacks, which, you know, I personally don't uh, think that the stacks approach is as good or as um, deeply tied to Bitcoin. But certainly, you know, from the perspective of their mission, what they're trying to do is build smart contract platform for Bitcoin. Um, and they've been seeing good traction as well. And there's a whole bunch of other efforts like the RGB or the DLC technologies that are being developed right now. There's stuff being done with Liquid. I think the biggest thing that's happening on Liquid right now is the announcement with El Salvador of um, their plans to issue a billion dollars in government bonds on Liquid. Um, so the, the amount of progress that has been made this year is remarkable more has happened in terms of building out it's not just more it's like 99 percent of everything that has happened in terms of progress including with lightning network as well um uh around bitcoin layer two uh smart contracts for bitcoin DeFi for bitcoin and lightning network has happened over the last six months and that's remarkable we're starting to see um you know, projects that have been incubating for a very, very long time start to see very, very real growth. Can I add a question on top of that question? Go ahead. So I know one NFT collection, for example, that is based on Ethereum on OpenSea and wants to work with a company called Stax. That's basically bringing DeFi to Bitcoin, it um, enables you to build apps, smart contracts, digital assets uh, that are integrated with Bitcoin. And I wanted to know, like, if in your in your guys's opinion, if a project goes from this ETH to the Bitcoin smart contracts, do you guys think that it will make the NFTs more valuable in any way? Uh, I don't think it makes them more valuable in the short term necessarily, unless they're kind of related to Bitcoin culture uh, directly. But what I do think it does, depending on how, look, NFT projects today are very exciting to a lot of people, but I think they're really a proof of concept. Um, most of them are not really decentralized. The metadata is stored on centralized servers. Uh, if those servers go down, then basically you've got a signature which doesn't point to anything. Um, and, um, and so really what I think we need, and, 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 and one, of the th one of the things I really respect about the Bitcoin community is they, they, take, they, they take building things properly seriously. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's been two big approaches, right? So like, you know, like I would say like the, 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 the move fast and break things high innovation approach has been, uh, probably best represented by the Ethereum community, the highly secure conservative, um, approach uh, you know, move slow and secure things has been uh, uh, best represented by Bitcoin. I think what Bitcoin Layer 2 does is it finds this happy medium where you can be far more experimental, you can take far more risks, but you're still tied down. Uh, you know, you're still basically, your foundation is that is the very, very secure Bitcoin culture. So what I'm seeing with NFT projects, for example, with Sovereign, is much more of an emphasis around making sure that the NFTs actually are decentralized, actually are self-sovereign, actually are self-owned um, in a way that there's less emphasis on them. If you like, for example, OpenSea, which is the most popular market today, um, th when you mint something through OpenSea, uh, you know that the, the you you're you're doing that on their servers. They're 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 saving that image on their server, and so you get the hash of 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 the NFT. But what it points to is on a centralized 
system. So, um, you know, I think there's also some education that people need to experience, but, um, you know, also the front running scandal that happened um, uh, on OpenSea, you know, these, these are things that maybe, I, maybe we should be less forgiving of as a community. Yeah, because I was also thinking about NFTs on IPFS. I use IPFS for my NFTs. And, you know, so that way, if, for example, one website goes down that hosts the images, then I could go on another website that's an NFT marketplace that for that blockchain and I could still see the image. So I think that's another improvement that I think will come along to IPFS. I think that's going to play a big role. Right. 100%. So. No, no, sorry. Please go. No, sorry, Yago. Actually, I just wanted to drop my two cents very quickly. I'm not as an expert as Yago in the topic, right? It's a DeFi Bitcoin topic. But look, I'm going to try to keep it short uh, from my small um, Venezuelan Bitcoin lens, right? Of how I've seen things evolve uh, coming from Venezuela uh, pre-2013 in Bitcoin up until today, right? So, um after Venezuela got, got sanctioned, right? And this is the, the government and not the country. If you were a Venezuelan resident, you, you have to go through hell, right? If you want to do KYC Bitcoin most of the time, right? Especially if, you, if you're dealing with a North American exchange or whatever, right? So uh, I'm going to give you an example, Uphold, right? So uh, pre-2017 with Uphold, if you had a bank account, if you were one of the few Venezuelans, right, that had a bank account in the U.S., you were able to buy Bitcoin via ACH in a second, right, using all pool services. But then after some years, you would get this email that says, look, you're, we no longer care about you. You're a Venezuelan resident. You're more of a liability to our business model and to our business than anything else, right? So I guess that this is to say from a, a, a personal and live example, right, that Anything that anything that is not that centralized and at least for now is not prone to so much regulation under the eye of first world country regulators, right, uh, can ultimately turn out being something positive for some people in emerging markets. That said, and to Dennis's point, right, if you look at the milkshake theory, and if you look at a petrodollar system that is purely based on the dollar as the reserve currency asset, right, for the globe, the globe craves and demands dollars more than Bitcoin right now, right? And that's partly why you see stable coins yearly volume being bigger than Bitcoin. So if you're a Venezuelan, for example, right, it is easier for you to access the dollar via USDT, USDC, US whatever stable coin you want to you want to use than an actual dollar bank account, right? And even PayPal because you would you would require a US phone number, right? So ultimately, if DeFi and Bitcoin will achieve for Bitcoin to be able to funnel right? Global transactions and global demand for dollars through the Bitcoin network. And yes, we have Strike as an example that use, uses only Bitcoin as a monetary, right? Monetary transmission network. Awesome. But, th but if we ultimately, with RGB contracts to Yago's point, are able to include things like USDT inside the Lightning Network, then Bitcoin will ultimately become the DeFi and most efficient platform, right? To funnel dollars from wherever to anywhere in the world, right? The fastest, the cheapest, the smartest, whatever, the most accessible. So, so I'm trying to, just to speak to the audience, right? As a, as a person coming from this hyperinflationary world, right? Where, where we already saw fiat die, right? And have tried this many different things just to just to keep my family safe, right? And this this is going to, going to be ultimately the case of many people in emerging markets, like in Turkey, like in South Africa, Nigeria, right? This is not only Venezuela. So I think that 
from an emerging market person perspective, I believe that Bitcoin DeFi, not only for, for these things, right? And, and, and the retail person from, from the skirts of, of the world, I think that also on, a, on an institutional level will be highly, highly important because right now, if you look into the DeFi space, it is purely a VC funded industry, right? It is mostly institutional players, big transactions from institutional, institutional money, right? So I guess that ultimately we need that smart money being funneled into Bitcoin, right? And Bitcoin innovation as well. So if Bitcoin DeFi and the Bitcoin DeFi narrative is a way to get that, I think that it'll ultimately be positive. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. I agree with some of what Yago said. I think that, you know, with uh, directing this towards uh, Miss T and Crypto's question, I, I don't know if bringing NFTs to Bitcoin necessarily makes them more valuable. I think there's a lot of work to be done um, with, with NFTs. I, I do agree with the premise that there's some sort of proof of concept. And I think that some of the NFTs out there will hold value. Ones that have historical significance especially will hold value because um, they're more or less like an, an artifact to some extent. Uh, to see it's still T TBD, whether they're going to be used broadly in the way that they're being used today. I think there's a lot of people who hope and, and, and would align with that future and would like things to be that way, uh, especially artists. I, I, I appreciate the fact that artists have had the ability to use NFTs, but um, I, I don't know if they're going to continue to be used the same way. I think that the linking the item itself to uh, the digital signature that you're creating is, is a problem. I think IPFS uh, is a workaround. It's a Band-Aid, but you're still depending on other people. It's not truly... Uh, trustless and permissionless in that sense. But um, yeah, I, I'm not a massive expert on DeFi and I, I hope that p companies like Liquid as a Bitcoin only guy, I hope like organizations like Liquid are successful. Uh, I like that they created a peg and did not create a new asset. I think that's really important for myself and for many other Bitcoiners out there. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Aaron, you want to go? Uh, regarding you... yeah, regarding Bitcoin or DeFi on Bitcoin, uh, I mean, first of all, mm -hmm. if, if any of us knew the future, we'd all be rich, right? Um, and uh, you know, things change so much year to year. Who's to say? I mean, I'm personally excited about it. Um, I, personally, I, I like the fact that Bitcoin has uh, stayed nice and decentralized and secure and hasn't tried to move fast and break things. That gives these other chains the freedom to kind of you know do the trade offs and do that thing while Bitcoin uh, stays. The most secure now um as far as DeFi and bitcoin i think it's interesting i have no idea if it's going to i think it's going to grow i have no idea what the market is going to deem most valuable you know ethereum DeFi or solana DeFi or bitcoin DeFi. but uh, i'm certainly excited about it what you guys at sovereign are doing or stacks yeah obviously it's also going to be a very very special uh year for sovereign um with our zero launch and Virtual shops and uh, NFTs, obviously. So we, we, we have we have a lot uh, a lot of stuff coming in. Um, many more uh, news that will come in the coming months. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, obviously, for all of you who are uh, still with us uh, but didn't follow us yet, so make sure to follow us on Twitter, Telegram, join our communities on Telegram and Discord. Um, you can find the link on our website, sovereign.app. Scroll to the bottom, join our Discord community where you can ask all your questions. Um, and also important to join our YouTube channel where you can see all of Sovereign's videos, um, tutorials, and new stuff that we're uploading. So make sure to subscribe. Okay. Um, I think we it's time for some gambling. Uh, so I want to hear your guy, you guys, uh, 22, 22 projections, and then uh, we can open it for people from the uh, audience. So if you guys are waiting to ask your question, stay. <laughs> uh, we are still here. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere. Um, and I will put you up uh, by the order of your requests. Don't worry, I have everyone here not noted down. So... Um, Yago, let's go with you. Um, Bitcoin price end of year 2022. 
Um, we need something for the big tweets. Idan Iago says. <laughs> um, well, uh, so first of all, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I, I, uh, I would hope that it, uh, that, that it grinds up uh, you know, and that, uh, you know, I would be very happy with $150,000 instead of say, you know, $250,000 in the middle of the year and $50,000 at the end of the year, I would be very happy with it slowly grinding up next year, you know, um, yeah, and maybe having some 50 plus swings so that people can buy on the cheap. But, um, but I haven't the faintest clue. I thought I, uh, you know, had a model which I'd experienced several times. I'd, you know, gone through three of the uh, these harvesting waves. Yeah, I was expecting it to happen again. Now I don't know what's happening. So I'm a new ball over again, and it's exciting. Um, what I do think uh, is, I think we'll start to see more of an economy being built around uh, Bitcoin in terms of the smart contract platforms. Uh, being built on uh, Bitcoin, I think Sovereign is going to have a very, very exciting year. Um, so, uh, yeah, I I, um, I have no idea, but but I think it's going to be very, very volatile, um, at least as volatile as this year. Um, and um, but I think it's I think it's going to end up higher. Uh, Quite a bit higher. I, th I think we're going to be at, be up at least fifty percent from where we are now. Uh, probably, probably much more than that. All right, that's that's a cautious but yet bullish uh, statement from Iago. Okay, so one for the bulls. Uh, Dennis, what is your end of year twenty twenty two price projection? Yeah, I, I agree with Yago. I think this year has proved once again that no one has any idea where the Bitcoin price is going. It, uh, the, the cycles are lengthening. Uh, it's, it's what it seems at this point. You know, we're past Christmas. We're going into the new year. We don't see a big uh, continuous crash. We're kind of stabilizing in a range. Uh, I think a lot of us thought we would see Bitcoin much higher than we do today. And uh, for two things, one, that might be disappointing to some of the new people out there, but I couldn't be more than happy to have Bitcoin down at these prices. I love to buy cheap sats. I love to buy cheap Bitcoin. Uh, if Bitcoin went to a million dollars, I'd be excited for a moment. And then I'd be really, really pissed off that I didn't have more Bitcoin. I think a couple things that could make a big difference on the price is obviously what's going on with inflation, what's going on with the Fed whether we start tapering, um, whether the market sees Bitcoin as a risk on or a risk off asset as we move towards that future, um, any sort of black swan events, uh, ma massive macro changes could really impact the, the price of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that it's pretty safe to say that we'll be double from where we are by some time, some time next year. Um, but again, <laughs> no one knows. I don't think anyone will ever know. It's impossible uh, as uh, Altcoin said earlier, if we were able to predict the future, I think that everyone would be rich. Uh, but we cannot predict the future, and we have to take risks. So uh, take risk accordingly. Try, you know, get as much Bitcoin as you can, but also at the same time, make sure you're saving up enough money to pay your bills without having to pull your Bitcoin out of your uh, hardware wallet. And please don't keep your Bitcoin on an exchange. Yeah, I definitely second that. Um, heard so many bad stories from friends. Um, just take it to a hardware wallet. It's so easy. Always think of your Bitcoin and crypto also, if you'd like. Uh, but always think of, of, of your coins as if they are worth 10 times more than they are right now. So just make sure to back them up the way it fits. Um, missing crypto, Sultan. Aaron, do you want to give us your end of year 2022 price projections? Yeah, sure. I'm just robbing my crystal ball right here, right now. One second. No, no, I'm just kidding. Look, um, I, I guess that before giving up a specific price target, right, which which ultimately makes no sense. Um, if we take into consideration part of what Michael Saylor has shared with us, right, and he's institutional, like, right, CEO of a public listed company experience, is that either you're a public or private company, whatever, you have to go through at least a, a three-month 
process, right? Just to open up an OTC account, right? With any big exchange, be it Coinbase, Kraken, or whichever, right? And gain approval from your legal team and the board of directors of the company, right? And uh, as soon as you start the discussions of we want to buy spot Bitcoin, it takes that, a, that, that amount of time as a minimum for them to just have an account set up and then start buying Bitcoin via wire transfer, right? So I, I guess that if we, for more institutional money to come in a more streamlined way in a Bitcoin, we will need to see a spot Bitcoin ETF approval or at least the conversion of the Grayskull Bitcoin Investment Trust into a spot Bitcoin ETF, right? Because ultimately that would allow the trillions of dollars that are currently sitting in brokerage accounts and mutual funds, right? Being funneled more, more rapidly in, into Bitcoin, right? Th this is not to say that, I'm, that, that Bitcoin needs a, an ETF or whatever, right? It's just talking from the institutional side of things, right? Um, if we do see that, like the approval of a Bitcoin, Bitcoin spot ETF, potentially just, just like Dennis thinks, right? I would, I wouldn't see a problem with Bitcoin, Bitcoin's price doubling from current levels, right? And and potentially even surpassing the magical one hundred thousand dollar level, right? Uh, so I guess it's that's uh, that's what, part of the things that I have in mind. Ultimately, another another interesting development that I'm seeing, right? Uh, especially working at Ledin, was the introduction of her latest product with this, which is the bitcoin mortgage right that ultimately will allow first canadian residents and u.s residents from certain states to essentially use their house right as a collateral just to buy more bitcoin or vice versa like you can use your bitcoin to to get a loan to buy a house so so i i think that it's interesting that we, we are still in the process of bitcoin becoming the most brilliant and pristine asset class and the world reserve currency. And if that's going to happen, what we will continue seeing is an introduction of more financial products supporting Bitcoin, right? Like ultimately you will be able to at some point access any stock option, debt derivative, whatever it is, right? Mortgage using Bitcoin, right? So uh, I think that that's what I have in mind for 2022 other than, sovereign states other than in Salvador, right? Getting into the into the wagon and issuing right like bonds to market by five hundred million dollars of Bitcoin. I think that's gonna take time, more time, right? On the state side of things, at least for the next halving halving cycle for, for it to happen. But uh, I guess that's pretty much the uh, what I'm seeing right now. And I just mentioned the the Bitcoin mortgage thing because ultimately it's a uh, it's going to be another way for part of the 300 trillion global plus, right, uh, market cap of real estate uh, diving into into Bitcoin, right? So uh, that that would be my two cents. Guys, I just want to jump on real quick because I got to jump off to do a Naomi Brockwell stream. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, my Bitcoin prediction is, man, I thought Bitcoin was going to be at least over 100K this year. I was actually open for 200K. I, I think it's kind of exciting. Like Yago said, the four-year cycle seemingly is broken. And, you know, all of us were kind of hoping for the blow off top this year. Maybe we could take a year off and just chill. That's not happening. And if it keeps grinding up slowly, that's even better. Uh, my Bitcoin prediction, let's say I'll go 200K. That's what I said for this year, but I'll go 200K again. But anyways, thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks for joining us, Aaron. See you, dude. Always happy See you later. Um, okay, that, that was uh, maybe... Uh, I see Aaron, uh, Bitcoin Hedge Fund Manager, has joined us. Um, would you like to say hello? Maybe give your price prediction. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, sorry I came on a little late here, so I missed a good portion of the conversation. Um, I mean, listen... First of all, let me start with humility, which is I think I can echo what everybody said, which is we all had certain expectations for 2021 that were um, a little underwhelming in some cases, though. I think it's kind of funny when you stop and think about it that Bitcoin and, of course, many of the altcoins out there are up 65, you know, Bitcoin's around 60 percent year to date. 
and many other all kinds of course are up more than that and if you look at you know legacy markets you know this is one of the best years that you could have in the stock market we're up 27 percent but a lot of asset managers don't feel that way huge underperformance but for a world where people are so in, in, in such disbelief at Bitcoin's performance, it's still the best performing asset, you know, of, of a major asset class. So let's put the altcoins aside for a second. Of a major asset class of a trillion dollar kind of context or more, um, there's nothing out there that's come, even come close. So um, I think it, it's helpful to remain, um, to have a little bit of context as we head into 2022. Now, that being said, I, I'll also echo what some of the other, um, you know, what Yago and what Dennis said about the lengthening of the cycle. I think, I think it's TBD, you know, if the cycle is lengthening or if, you know, the cycle has ended. Um, I prefer not to even think about it in cycles as much. Um, it, to me, it makes sense that the cycle should break. Um, <clears throat> if you look at ever since Bitcoin became a macro asset, you know, digital real estate, digital gold, whatever, nomenclature you want to use or whatever kind of bucket you want to put it in, it's very clear that the correlation between Bitcoin and interest rates has gone up materially since around June of 2020. Um, the, the correlation is actually, you know, extremely high. It's around 50 percent on a rolling, you know, uh, on a rolling three month basis, basically. And this is something that used to have essentially zero correlation. Now, of course, that has created a correlation with equities as well. Um, and that correlation with equities has, has only gone up. And that's been part of the problem for Bitcoin, especially in, in the last few months. Um, the work that we do, you know, the work, you know, obviously I have, I'll leave the predictions about DeFi and some of the technological developments to, to others on stage who are be better fit to answer that. My, my personal view about 2022 for Bitcoin is that we're actually going to see a pretty nasty wash in the first quarter, unfortunately. I could see us going down to like 37 to 42K kind of context. Um, I think it'll be kind of a bear trap though. And I think the fundamental reason that it'll, it'll happen is because despite equities kind of grinding up right now, there are so many echoes to the late 1930s right now that I can't even, um, it's not, this is not the, the appropriate platform to kind of get into that. But, but the bottom line is that the, the amount of monetary fiscal stimulus that's going to kind of come off the boils next year is, is still widely underappreciated. There's, there's a figure of speech in Wall Street that um, you buy the first hike, the first Fed hike, and you sell the penultimate one. And that has worked in the last 30, 40 years. And that is where this, this axiom has come from. It's come from the current generation of Wall Street participants. And the reason that is so is because usually the Fed starts hiking when the economy starts heating up, when there's a certain escape velocity. So it's actually a good sign that they're able to hike. And that's why you buy that historically. And that's the current narrative right now. You know, there's, and if you look at things like the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index, which takes a, an amalgamation of rates and FX um, rates, as well as equity market, credit spreads and things like that. And I come from a credit background, so I'm acutely aware of, of credit spreads being ridiculously tight right now. Despite what the Fed has come out and done, and they've made a massive shift in policy. Like, I think we don't really realize how much they've, they've made this shift in policy. And of course, that's why Bitcoin is struggling right now, as it should, as it should temporarily. You know, it's not the long, it has nothing to do with long, Bitcoin's long term use cases in any way, shape, or form. But as from a liquidity standpoint, as, it, as all assets at the end of the day on a short term basis are liquidity assets, from a liquidity asset, it, it has, uh, taking the wind out of the sails. But what I think we're going to come to realize is that one, they're not doing nearly enough in this talk of, of, of basically being done with, with unwinding QE by March or April, doing a first hike by somewhere between May and June, this is what's currently priced in the rates markets, is going to be pulled forward massively. I think people are, are dramatically under, underestimating the continuation of, of a lot of these you know, labor supply issues a lot of more labor supply than the supply chain issues like supply chain issues. Yes, those might be quote unquote transitory, but um, without getting too, too deep, I don't want to take up too much time, but, but basically I think what we're going to end up seeing is that some point in Q1, the market's going to say, holy shit, inflation is still pretty damn elevated. There's things that are going to mathematically prevent it from actually declining like uh, owner's equivalent rent in the CPI. 
And the Fed is going to actually end up probably having to hike 50 bips in March is our current, current view. And I think the market's going to start to price that in at some point. It's going to get ugly. Bitcoin's not going to be, um, you know, is not going to unfortunately uh, be able to extricate itself from that mess. And, and that will get a huge move. But I think right now what you have is you have a bowling alley. <laughs> you have this analogy. I think someone used it recently on a podcast. And, and we use a similar analogy when we talk about um, when we when we talk about a bell curve. In the last 30 years, we've had this very wide distribution of a Goldilocks zone in the bell curve for a mild inflation environment. And right now, given the debt levels and given the underlying inflation that has been created to accommodate events over the last two years, we have squeezed that lane. If you want to use the bowling terminology, we now have a very, very minor strike zone and we have huge gutters. And on one side, we have a gutter of inflation. On the other side, we have a gutter of deflation. And the Fed thinks it has a dial, but it really just has a switch. And if it doesn't hit the perfect strike, we go into one gutter or the other. And what's going to happen next year is we're going to start to go into the deflation gutter. And they're going to have to pull back massively. And I think that's what that starts to lend itself to the, to the reinvigoration of Bitcoin adoption. Because I think the biggest surprise of this year, for me at least, is when you look at retail activity in Bitcoin, it's been pretty subpar. You know, it peaked basically in May and it didn't even peak anywhere near the rate of adoption in terms of growth rates that we saw in prior cycles. And I think it was, it was maybe heading that way and then things got cut short. Maybe there's too much leverage in the system this year. I think that's something that needs to get itself worked out is the amount of just leverage trading that goes on. Um, and some of that is working itself out, I think, as China tightens their exchange policies and as people start using more um, Bitcoin backed or, you know, crypto backed um, leverage uh, or sorry, le less crypto backed leverage and more stable coin backed leverage, um, which doesn't create as much cascading effects. But I, but I think that's really held back some of the adoption. And I do think things like lightning, I do think things it's still being underestimated. I, I could see I don't know if any of you were on the call with Michael Saylor earlier this week um, with Eric Weiss, where he was talking philosophically about Bitcoin as digital energy. I think you're going to see more tech regulation. I highly recommend all of you listening to another recent podcast with Joe Rogan and Tristan Harris um, of the Social Dilemma variety. Um, there are huge problems with tech pl platforms. And I think someone was talking before about getting people more excited about Bitcoin via DeFi. And I think also because, because venture capital like to create things. That's what Michael Sayer was saying. Venture capital might know that there's a lot of problems in the world that Bitcoin helps mitigate. But these guys like to think of themselves as builders of beautiful things. And when you're mitigating disaster, you're not building a beautiful thing. You're protecting. You're, you're creating a defense. You're creating a military-like <clears throat> defiance to something. A sovereignty, right? I mean, <laughs> it's apt for this for, for this room, right? So they need to feel they being innovators and tech entrepreneurs need to feel like they're building something new and they're creating a new use case. And I think you can get that both from DeFi and from some of the tools that could actually start to help cr reduce some of the externalities or at least create a cost to some of the externalities that we see with tech and social media platforms, both from the users, you know, the lack of consequence for um, putting out bad misinformation, putting out bots, and, and that's only going to get worse and worse and worse without consequence. And also, of course, the platform owners themselves that have that wield so much power and so much centralization that they have more power than any government in human history has ever had. And I think if Bitcoin starts to move its focus to some of those issues, it will see a lot of of venture capital flow its way. And uh, I think that in combination with, with some of the retail adoption will really create a flywheel. So I've taken up way too much time, but that's, that, those are my thoughts. It's all right. That was, that was very good, uh, Aaron. And thank you very much for joining us, even if it's late. Uh, I, know, I know given the status, uh, you know, it's uh, very, I can really appreciate it. Um, okay, so perhaps that question was, you know, a bit easy. Uh, what would uh, Bitcoin, where would Bitcoin price go? Uh, but 
just for the last two, which is basically one uh, prediction that I would like to ask you guys is where is dominance heading in 2022? And I will sharpen the question because after 2017, and we all talked about it, the cycles for your cycles, um, after Bitcoin goes down, the altcoins have gone down massively more. Um, and now that we are no longer, maybe no longer in this cycle, uh, what's going to happen to altcoins and what's going to happen to Bitcoin dominance in uh, 2022? I'm not too sure about the dominance end of things, but I have seen um, when Bitcoin dips that a lot of altcoins don't go down. And especially in the metaverse realm, I've seen a lot of those type of tokens actually do the opposite of what Bitcoin does. So I'm very intrigued to see that if the markets separate in 2022 and more alts do their own thing. I'm, I'm actually very intrigued by this. Go, uh, Dennis, go, go for it. Yeah, I mean, as Bitcoin only guy, uh, I don't look at the dominance chart too much. I don't think, actually, I know most of the altcoins out there, uh, the cryptoverse is not really truly competing with Bitcoin. So it's a really... Um, it's just an inaccurate metric to use when you're trying to figure out how well Bitcoin is doing versus various altcoins out there. I think what you really should be looking at uh, as a metric is development of the technology itself, uh, adoption of the technology. And so we've seen that we have Lightning coming to full fruition. I think several years ago, people were doubting that Lightning would be a success. Uh, it's clearly very successful and people are using it all over the planet, all over the globe. Not only has Bitcoin been successful with its technology, but also it is being adopted by nation states. Nation states are adopting it. And we're also seeing nation states mining Bitcoin, which is a massive move. And I think that we'll see more and more countries mine Bitcoin as time goes on. I, I, I definitely prescribe to this concept or idea that Jason Lowry has been talking about where countries will essentially mine at a loss in order to protect themselves because of national security interests. Interests. Uh, I think that you also see uh, politicians, you see members of Congress that are working really hard to protect and defend Bitcoin specifically. And I think that's a massive change over the past where we've seen really kind of just a broad crypto uh, approach, which, you know, I, I understand there's people in this call that that's, that's what they care about. They're, they're crypto or um, uh, their their multi coin universe that they see moving forward. Uh, maybe there will be other things that survive, but I think it's just a bad metric in general. Uh, but that that being said, I definitely think that there will be lots of altcoins, crypto coins that are created in order to, uh, you know, that that are going to pump up and make a lot of money. And I think you'll see the market crap, the market crap, the market cap of the whole space grow significantly. I, I I'm used to think that you would see a world where Bitcoin is just going to crush everything and it's all going to go away. But I, I don't know if that's going to happen in the near term. Uh, it's been, I've been continuing to be amazed with the various projects out there that have been able to grow their market cap with virtually no product whatsoever. Uh, even the crypto space people have started to notice the difference. It's gone from what most Bitcoiners would, you know, they kind of label everything as bad, right? Because we're, we're Bitcoin only and then there's crypto. But the crypto people have even had a term that they've developed, which is the rug pull, right? Like there's there's crypto that's so bad that like most crypto people won't even touch it because it's just such a big scam. So I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think we're going to see an, a proliferation of of even more and more and more productless pro, um, coins that are created, pointless coins that are created. Uh, some will rise to the top. Uh, we've seen other coins survive multiple cycles now. But uh, as time goes on, I think that you'll see Bitcoin will continue to maintain its dominance over the thing that truly matters, which is being the base layer sound money that it is. And I'm not sure really anything can compete with that. So the dominance metric to me is I don't really look at it at all. So I think that dominance is undergoing in one direction, which is down. And then that's a great thing. Uh, but I'll say that it's a it's a bullshit measure, um, just like Dennis says. Uh, and the reason it's going down is because what we're seeing is we're starting to see more and more of the world being tokenized. The first big example of this uh, has been stablecoins, right? And so comparing what 
you know, comparing what percent, what how how dominant is Bitcoin versus stablecoins is basically comparing how dominant Bitcoin is to digitized dollars. It's not really a particularly relevant metric. Um, we're starting to see other things, um, equity like uh, uh, assets are being tokenized. Um, so. Um, Many DeFi protocols, um, what you're actually buying when you're buying a token is something which is in many ways very similar to um, right now very underpowered um, equity, right? So equity with far less rights than you would be getting if you were buying stock in a company. But it, 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 it's, it's effectively um, a tokenized uh, pseudo equities. So comparing Bitcoin, which is this uh, monetary commodity like asset to equities or to IOUs for fiat currencies doesn't make sense. Um, and we're going to just continue to see it. We're going to see real estate being tokenized. We're going to see debt instruments tokenized. We're going to see derivatives tokenized. We're going to see every single asset class tokenized, and we're going to see additional asset classes invented. And Bitcoin, you know, looking 15 years down the road, we're, we're looking at the uh, cryptographically secured economy, right? The tokenized economy is going to be a $200 trillion economy. And Bitcoin uh, could be $30 trillion out of that. It could be $50 trillion out of that. Um, you know, uh, uh, and it will be it will be the center of gravity for that economy. But you know, it's probably not going to be more than twenty five or thirty five percent of of the asset value in that particular economy. Um, so so I think dominance is is going down, uh, uh, mostly because it's a silly metric which isn't measuring anything in particular. At the same time. The many of the assets that I think uh, are quite, um, I, I, you know, so I think a lot of these smart contract platforms are going to look a lot like AOL, right? America Online in, in the year 2000 um, was a uh, 38, uh, th sorry, 30, $350 billion company. Uh, or, or in today's terms, about $480 billion, which is kind of similar to where Ethereum is today. Uh, a few years ago, it was sold uh, for less than a billion dollars. It didn't manage to capture value in the long term, even though it was very, very important at the time. And the reason is uh, because what AOL was doing was it was creating its own internet effectively, right? Like when you joined America Online, you got an, your, an email, which you could only use to email other people in America Online, and you, you, you could participate with in AIM, which is like a chat room for people in America Online, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the smart contract platforms, or basically this whole layer one space, um, is I think going taking a very dangerous turn. Um, they are in a race to the bottom in terms of fees. Um, if you can't, if, if, if the fees are going to zero, then the tokens uh, are going to go to zero as well because the tokens are effectively a way of capturing transactional value. Um, and if the token value is hard to maintain because it's in a very competitive environment and these systems are based on proof of stake, well, then you have tokens which lose value and systems which lose security as a result. And so... Uh, I'm quite skeptical of the long-term viability of those systems, uh, but uh, but I think the depths that are being built on top of them, you know, I think the Uniswaps, the compounds of the world, uh, could turn out to be uh, vastly more valuable than the layer one systems that today seem to be so much more valuable than them and upon which they are being built. <clears throat> all right. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you, Iago. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, and Mr. Crypto um, for joining us for this past two amazing hours. Um, I hope you guys have some time for a bit more questions. We had 
throughout the space we had over 45 or 50 people requested to speak uh, right now we have about uh, nine who who were uh, patient enough to stay with us so starting to get you up here on stage uh, one by one um, by the order of requesting um, and we'll do it as long as our beloved guests can enjoy, uh, can stay. So I'll just point out uh, that I'm going to have to pop off in about 10 minutes. All right. All right. Let's, uh, cool. let's use those 10 minutes, uh, wisely. So, uh, one question each. Okay. David, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm curious what your guys' biggest frustration with Bitcoin or the community has been this past year. And in particular, what gives you hope, um, to kind of improve that specific situation? Um, and I can gently nudge the conversation and say that for me personally, it's kind of this assumption that the future is promised for Bitcoin and that the future has been preordained to us. And I struggle a lot uh, with that concept. So I'll leave it there and let you guys riff off that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, basically, Bitcoin provides a very unique utility um, to billions of individuals around the globe. And that utility is very, actually very specific. It provides a durable store of value that allows those individuals to escape government control, specifically capital controls and regulatory frameworks. So that utility is fundamentally important to every single individual on the planet Earth to take control, entire control of their wealth. And when I say to take control of their wealth, I actually mean a physical possession of their wealth. Because remember, prior to Bitcoin, individuals weren't actually able to take a physical possession of their wealth without actually other people, states, and, um, and uh, bigger corporations being able to confiscate it. Like for example, with gold, you cannot actually take physical possession. You can, but nobody actually does. Like nobody stored gold in their safes, which is primary reason why actually gold became completely centralized and taken over by banks and large institutions. With Bitcoin, every single, and that's very important for people in the audience to understand is that you, every single one of you uh, in the audience, with Bitcoin, you can take a physical possession of your wealth in a way that nobody else can confiscate it from you. So when you hear all of this stuff about DeFi, about fucking NFTs, right? None of this stuff allows you to take a physical possession of your wealth the way that Bitcoin does. And my hope for 2022 and my prediction is that more individuals around the globe will actually realize that they have this unique ability and unique utility that Bitcoin provides to them, which is ability to, to take a physical possession of their wealth in a way that it cannot be confiscated by any other actor, whether it's individual, business, or state. All right. Good words, Neski. I thought you had a question, uh, but yeah. I'm, I'm happy to have you here on stage to answer uh, David's question. Iago, do you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, so I think that um, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community and with it the Bitcoin culture went through a traumatic event in the block size wars. Uh, and, and at the same time, there was the, um, you know, the rise of Ethereum and it, it made Bitcoin very defensive um, uh, culture. Um, I think that's starting to change. I think it's. Uh, I think we're seeing it all the time. I think we're seeing it in this conversation. I think we're seeing it uh, across crypto Twitter, um, and I think we're starting to see Bitcoin uh, looking to recapture that sense of adventure and innovation um, that marked it in its first uh, in its first years. So. Look, there's a very, um, a very unfortunate thing which has happened to our culture more generally, I think, is that um, social media in particular has uh, encouraged people to take very um, dramatic, aggressive stances because it gets them more clicks and more followers. And it has created a um, culture of conversation which is lowbrow, not particularly intellectual, and is hostile to new ideas. Uh, I think as Bitcoiners, we need to rise above that. And I think I'm starting to see signs that 
we we succumbed to it for a while, um, as does anything which becomes very popular, but that there is now starting to be a backlash against it. And, and that gives me hope. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin fundamentally does not participate in fake popularity contests, right? It does not have a marketing team. It does not have a fucking CEO, right? It's a purely decentralized. And again, uh, the, the, the the amazing thing about Bitcoin, and I think what the primary thing that why it really is different from, from other fucking scams is that the asset itself has really core and solid fundamentals and the community that's actually built around it and the network effect that was created on top of those fundamentals is actually as a solid as a rock. So anything else, Ethereum or any other scam coin, fundamentally they were built on a flawed foundation and they were able through a variety of very elaborate marketing scams to create a narrative, a very strong narrative that built a community that's sort of excited about their, their scam. But the bottom line is that the underlying foundation is flawed. I think, I think when you call Ethereum a scam, uh, you, you, you don't do Bitcoin a favor. Because people look at Ethereum and it's clearly not a scam, right? It may be flawed. It may be, um, you know, wrongheaded. It may be doomed to fail, but it's not a scam. There's uh, people who have been working very, very hard on Ethereum for six years trying to correct, you know, the, the problems that are the source of their original, you know, sin when it comes to design. Um, it's been a source of a huge amount of wealth uh, accumulation, some of it even real. And uh, most importantly, it's driven a huge amount of innovation. Uh, some of it extremely fundamentally important innovation. Uh, for example, zero knowledge proofs, uh, which are a, a massive advance in, in, in a very key primitive when it comes to cryptography. And so Bitcoin is walking around saying that Ethereum is a scam. I think it makes people look at Bitcoin as a scam, because if 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 you know you look at Ethereum and you say, "Wow, look at everything that Ethereum has built in terms also of community over the last six years," and then you have a whole bunch of people shouting, you know, "Scam!" It's like old man waves at fist at cloud. It's it's a, it's a it's the people who are calling it a scam who are losing credibility, not the other way around. So I think we need to point out its flaws with a deep understanding of what they are, uh, not, uh, uh, not uh, uh, um, sort of reduce ourselves to name calling. I think one of the biggest things that's had an impact on the dialogue in general really is spaces like these. Um, they disincentivize dunking. They disincentivize uh, screaming and shouting, whereas Twitter for a very long time incentivized, you know, just all out war and rage, but you can disconnect from the call, you know, at any time. So the, the speakers don't have to speak. Whereas on Twitter, you almost feel like you compelled to defend yourself. So I think these voice calls make a big difference. You can hear whether someone's being authentic or in inauthentic. And I think that's, in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons why you have seen more productive dialogue. I don't necessarily agree. There's things I disagree with um, generally that were said. I just, I think that the, the biggest reason why we'll, we'll see more conversation occurring and better dialogue is because we're actually talking to each other versus trying to dunk on each other for likes for our followers. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Iago, you have time for one final question? I have three minutes. Okay, so Kimia June, shoot your question, and hopefully three minutes will be enough. Hi, um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I just want to say thank you for uh, bringing me up for a question. I My question is, um, what is the likelihood that in the U.S. we would get a uh, ETF spot approval i know many have tried um i know there's some in canada that was approved but in the u.s i know a lot of people are saying that that would be the catalyst that would bring up to you know bitcoin to be over you know 100 to 150 as some of you guys have predicted but what do we think the likelihood of this etf approval to be done in um 2000, uh, 2022 thank you i don't have any particularly uh good insights into that 
Um, I've spoken to people who are working on it. Um, they were telling me it was around the corner two years ago. Um, so <laughs> they don't have very many insights into it either. Um, I probably, I would say probably not more than 50% chance that it happens in 2022. Um, you know, uh, that's not a, a, a particularly smart number. It's just like what I'm saying is I think it's a coin flip. Um, I think that Bitcoin doesn't need that uh, to go past 100, uh, $150,000 or even $250,000 in value. Um, uh, that could happen for many, many other reasons, including the dollar losing significant value. Um, what I will say is, uh, I, from my perspective, the, uh, in a way, I, I would like for it to happen is you know, for, for it to take as long as possible, because I would much rather that most people's first encounter with Bitcoin is through self-custody uh, than through some intermediary. Uh, I think it's important that people experience Bitcoin as Bitcoin and understand, you know, uh, in a visceral and personal way how this is different from everything else they've ever used. Uh, I must have missed the question. It, was there a was there a question beyond um, the last one? Yes. Um, oh, it was the ETF know. thing. My apologies. Yeah, um, ETF. sorry. It was people kept trying to call me on my phone, and it was like interrupting the the call, distracting me for a moment. Yeah, I, I'm the same with Yago. Not a Wall Street guy. I uh, don't have the pedigree for that. But speaking to people that are on the case, just you know, it always seems like it's right around the corner, right? And then. We keep denying all of these ETFs and pushing it further and further back. I think it's pretty embarrassing for us as a country to still be in this position where we don't have an ETF. Although, same same thing. I agree. I I, I don't necessarily uh, celebrate an ETF. I think that it does bring some some confidence to the marketplace for the average investor out there for for indus uh, industrial types, uh, institutional types. But um, for me personally, it's I, I would rather people buy Bitcoin. And hold it themselves in their own hardware wallets. Self custody is a big part. So Nesky talked about it's really important that people realize the power of self custody. And uh, get your Bitcoin off exchanges. Don't buy uh, paper Bitcoin. That's how, this is how we got sixty one hundred two'd. Like we all decided to buy paper gold. We all decided to store our gold um, uh, with cust with custodians. And that's how they took the gold. Was they sixty one hundred two'd it? And the government came and took all the gold. So. If you do not, I just put a tweet out about this today. If you don't want to get 6102, please stop buying paper Bitcoin. Stop storing your Bitcoin on exchanges because governments, when they uh, when they see honeypots, they tend to go after them. So don't make a honeypot for the government. Self custody your own Bitcoin. Um, and I think that uh, I think that's my uh, full opinion on ETFs. Yeah, but uh, they'll probably be good for price, right? Because it'll people will be like, yay. Uh, consumer co uh, confidence is going to go up. Uh, investor confidence is going to go up. I'll buy more Bitcoin, right? But it's not really good for the the fundamentals of Bitcoin in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, for 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 an individuals, like the most important thing is they take a physical possession of their wealth, self custody. Um, like I agree that ETF is going to help legitimize Bitcoin for like institutions and etc. It's very easy for them to go and use use ETF. Um, but uh, for individuals, again, focus on taking a physical possession because remember with Bitcoin. It's it's super super easy. It just takes a few clicks, and um, that's it. You got it, and you can store your Bitcoin for the next two hundred years without it being confiscated by anyone, by any state or any other actor. Guys, uh, I want to say thank you very much uh, for for being here with me. I'm going to have to drop off, but this has been an amazing conversation. What a fantastic way to wrap up what has been a phenomenally exciting year for Bitcoin. So many things that I wouldn't have expected uh, to happen, happened. So many very, very big stories. Uh, Dennis, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Judas, thanks for uh, organizing this. This has been super cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having See us, Iago. Thank you uh, um, with your team sovereign for everything that you guys are doing to try to bring DeFi to Bitcoin. I'm, I'm always curious to see who's going to do it first. Uh, I'd love to actually keep ripping off this conversation if we can keep it going, if, if Nasky, Dennis, and everybody else who's out there wants to stay on. Um, I mean, I can stay to finish out with David if you want, uh, Judas, but I'm. it's up to you, man. 
I'm absolutely happy to let you guys speak. I know we have a lot of people who want to join the conversation, and we have a lot of cool people here listening. Uh, I don't want to out you guys, but you know you're here, so and you know you have uh, some stuff to say about Bitcoin. So uh, uh, perhaps join us on the stage, Mike, Timothy, Tristan. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you're more than welcome to to join us. And uh, yeah, it looks like the conversation is popping, so I'm not gonna kill it. Um, it's the end of the year, so let's celebrate. Yeah, um, Brenna, I'm cool. gonna bring some more people up here. Um, more people who have been waiting. Unless David, you wanna raise something? Yeah. Do you, do you mind if I just follow up on that on that conversation? So, Dennis, you, you brought up uh, you know Order sixty one hundred two a bunch, which you know I think most people know that's you know when the government went and seized all of the gold, and so it's a huge centralization and custodial risk. Um, but do you think without DeFi? that we are subjecting a lot of Bitcoin users to a potential 6102 risk. And in particular, yes, we should always promote self-custody on the Bitcoin main layer above all else. But there inevitably are a lot of people that use these centralized exchanges like the Coinbase, like the Celsius, like the BlockFi's. And I think that the way where DeFi is trending, and in particular what, what Sovereign is trying to do, really helps reduce that risk. And so I'm just curious your kind of perspective on like, how do you balance between this kind of risk of order 6102 versus the inevitability of people wanting to earn yield on their products of wanting to have a financial type of custodian? Um, I, I think that's a very important topic. I mean, you can earn yield on your Bitcoin right now with the Lightning how? Network. You can earn yield on Bitcoin right now with the Lightning Network. Like it's not a problem and it's it's... So go do that if that's what you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in like Ponzi-nomics, like earning yield, like, yeah, that's going to, you know, that's not going to be something you're going to be able to do with Bitcoin. Um, and most of those systems are not, and, and I'm not labeling all DeFi Ponzi-nomics, but a lot of it is at this point. Um, I hope that we see a world where it's not, and I don't know what that system will look like. I'm not a technical person. Like I said, I'm, a, I'm in, over here fighting the Bitcoin political fight. I'm over here fighting to get members of Congress on board with making Bitcoin a part of our future. But yeah, I think that it's a real problem to centralize Bitcoin on these exchanges. And I don't see how DeFi helps with that yet because I don't think DeFi in a sense is decentralized enough to survive a nation state attack. Uh, most of it is not. And so a, a government goes and puts a hun to the, gun to the head of most of these DeFi platforms, the people that control it. Um, I don't see I don't see it playing out. But again, I'm not technical enough. Maybe you have a, a counterpoint to that, but I, I don't see it being built in a way that it could survive that sort of an attack. Yeah, I think that's um, a reasonable assessment um, in terms of kind of like the credibility of DeFi is, is, is still being built. But I think it's um, an admirable goal to pursue. Um, on the Lightning Network yield, I would definitely push on that. Um, becoming a, a, a profitable routing node is, is pretty difficult for the average user. And things like Lightning Pool, um, don't have the scale to where you could, you know, reasonably create yield like on, on a mass scale. It's just, it's not there yet. And e even the lightning pool, um, you know, builders like, like Gentry and stuff would agree with that. And if you technically dig into the details of lightning pool and how it works, it actually uses a centralized auctioneer kind of type, type, type figure on the back end. So, um, you know, I mean, all just small little critiques there. And then I'll also add that, you know, a, a commonly touted topic in, in the Bitcoin community is Pierre Richard's article about a speculative attack where we take our Bitcoin, we never sell it, and we borrow against it, and we speculative attack the dollar. But when we're doing that, in order to do that, we have to use a centralized custodian in order to borrow dollars. Yeah, don't, don't borrow against Bitcoin. Don't use it as a collateral. Don't use it for yield. Just uh, seriously, the most important thing for individuals to keep their Bitcoin in cold storage for the next 200 years and forget about it. Like, don't I'd get enticed by point. the yield. Don't get yeah. enticed by anything that is being promised to you by any centralized institutions. It's very, very important for people in the audience so, to understand it. So, yeah, I mean, generally, I agree with the premise that most people should probably store their Bitcoin in cold storage and avoid any sort of leverage. I think there are unique situations where people understand risk. Um, they have a large assets that they can borrow against, like a home, to be able to buy more Bitcoin. I'm not saying don't use leverage at all. But it's it's right now we're in the wild, wild west. I mean, we're still so early and the odds of you putting your Bitcoin on one of these uh, lending platforms and borrowing against it, there's there's an odds there that that you won't get your Bitcoin back. And so I just don't think it's worth it. Although I understand people want to earn yield, but you know what? Bitcoin goes up 100 percent to 200 percent per year. I think that's plenty enough yield. We don't need to get greedy here. 
Um, we don't need to be picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. Like there, the, we need to be focusing on the future, the next 10 years. And if you're worried about, um, you know, making money on your Bitcoin, I, I just think that you should be focusing on the value creation of the entire ecospace growing, which will add value to Bitcoin itself. Like go build an app that will bring value to Bitcoin and then your Bitcoin will go up in value. Go convince your me the members of Congress to adopt Bitcoin. That'll make your Bitcoin go up in value. Like there are ways to make your Bitcoin earn more value. And a lot of them don't include putting them on to centralized custodial exchanges to earn yield. I mean, I understand the temptation there because you're like, wow, all I have to do is put my Bitcoin on this exchange and I earn, you know, 5%, but which is really going down, to be honest, quite, quite significantly. I think some of them are down to as little as like two or 3%. But generally speaking, you should avoid that. Someone like Michael Saylor, I mean, he's borrowing against his own company. Like that, he, he, he's not borrowing against the value of his Bitcoin. He might do that in the future when the market is more stable and that there's products that make sense, but he's borrowing against the value of his business. Uh, that's how he's able to buy all of this Bitcoin. And I think it's a calculated risk on his part and it's a smart move. I think if people will go down, it'll go down as one of the smartest trades in human history, but he's not borrowing against his Bitcoin. So that's the assertion that, you know, when people borrow against their Bitcoin, they have to do that, but that somehow Michael Saylor is doing the same thing. Yeah, I would love if Michael Saylor could self custody billions of dollars of Bitcoin, but I pretty, you know, have a strong understanding of why he does not do that, right? He does not do that because that's a pretty risky endeavor to try to, to self custody billions of dollars in Bitcoin, not only make himself a personal target for the entire world, um, but it's just too much on the line, really, right? And obviously, for accounting reasons, I imagine he can't do it either. Italy. And with respect to the Lightning Network, uh, like it's very important to understand that Lightning Network has grown substantially, not in terms of the total capacity, but also in terms of its ability to absorb new individuals and quickly ramp them up and have those individuals run a highly like effective and profitable Lightning node. Um, I mean, we hear stories that people literally within weeks, like four to six weeks, are able to get their node up and running and start earning yield. Now, I'm not saying that it's um, it's easy. I mean, it's like you have to learn new skills uh, because you're going to be facing uh, all sorts of challenges with the Lightning Network because it's the largest uh, decentralized network at the moment. Um, and you'll be able to not only obtain new skills, but uh, get uh, you know, fundamentally selected peers. Um, you can also um, figure out, okay, what mission you want to sort of follow yourself? Like, do you want to support El Salvador? Do you want to support other countries? So there are plenty of opportunities for any individual to really learn your skills and um, become an expert in Lightning Network. And it really, with PlebNet specifically, uh, with community of independent node operators, like it's it gotten much easier. For sure. And I just want to, I'll, I'll put a pin in this, unless we want to keep going on it. I'll say it. Lightning is amazing. I'm incredibly thankful for everybody that's building on it. And of course, do not put your coins on a centralized exchange. I just want to say that there are other options, which caveat emptor that, you know, I think people should look into that um, would be suited for some people. So. Um, I think just to uh, drop in on that, that, like that, like Dennis said, you, you, you can't be fully uh, like you know, like black or white. Go uh, loan your Bitcoin or don't loan your Bitcoin uh, at all. Um, as people are more sophisticated, obviously, uh, people who understand the risks, they would have different you know strategies for uh, and, and different allocations for uh, different kinds of products to invest in. So, and, and this is also what we're trying to do uh, at Sovereign with zero and just with regular lending um, is, is to provide people the option of borrowing against their Bitcoin without ever having it to sell it. Uh, and, and that, in my opinion, is a very strong uh, cause. And, and Michael Seller has already talked about it, actually. And he said uh, that if you bought, uh, if you bought, a part of Manhattan, uh, I don't know, a street or, or a block or whatever, back in the uh, 70s or 60s, then y y you would have never have sold it, right? I mean, uh, if, if, you ha if you still had it today, you would never have sold it. Um, so you just take the rent and you just try to get as much value out of it by loaning against it. Uh, and that's what people will do with their Bitcoin in 20, 40, 50 years, you name it. And, and these products and these financial systems around Bitcoin have to be built, in my opinion. Otherwise, uh, people will be 
it it will be very very hard to to, to spend your bitcoins. Uh, obviously, as as the government's still standing, uh, and it requires you to pay huge tax liabilities if you uh, sell your bitcoin and you pay cap gains. Obviously, depends on where where you live. But uh, loaning against bitcoin is essential for uh, it, Again, in my perspective, um, for functioning economy around Bitcoin. Um, now, I'd like to uh, obviously you can comment, but uh, I raised some people here uh, from the audience who've been waiting uh, all evening. So uh, let's do it according to the order. Um, so first we have I Satoshi with you, and then uh, Reza will ask his question, and then Don Wool. Okay, so I Satoshi with you. Go ahead. Hi, how's everyone doing? Um, so first of all, thank you for the sobering team. Uh, um, and then also uh, very interesting uh, listening to uh, Dennis and uh, Nesky. Um, so recent, um, there's a question that I have and uh, that has, uh, I have recently noticed an increase in popularity uh, in the present years in terms of uh, encouraging people um, setting up their own Bitcoin notes. Uh, I personally see this as an opportunity for learning. Uh, I'm just like on my own experience, which is very little. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I did not imagine a, re a year ago that I was going to be uh, a Bitcoin node operator. That's still in progress. Um, so it makes me very happy that I found these Twitter spaces where I can share uh, and learn um, some common interests. Um, and then my question uh, is how everyone that set up uh, their own Bitcoin note uh, will impact on helping the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, I also want to know that uh, very excited on Mint and um, also waiting for Zero to come out. We're our early contributors on SOP. Um, obviously, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin long term. Um, I know there is a reason why I'm always ended up listening to these very interesting uh, spaces. And I just want to put my grain of salt to help uh, build a, a better world. I'm, I'm going to um, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so Satoshi, your voice was kind of breaking up from me. I don't know if um, others experienced the same. Uh, no, I could hear him. I just, uh, I think I, we kind of missed the question there. Uh, first of all, thanks for the kind words regarding uh, Mint and Zero, and, and you know, supporting supporting Sovereign from the beginning. Um, and we hope to keep on bringing uh, good work to uh, make you happy. But if you could just repeat and and you know narrow down your uh, questions, uh, I Satoshi with you, so we can. Uh, Answer. Okay, my question is, how can everyone setting up their own um, Bitcoin node oh. can you... help uh, in, uh, to uh, strengthen the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem? Okay, so how setting up a node actually helps the Bitcoin ecosystem? Yeah, Dennis? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So yeah, when when you run a, a Bitcoin node, it's fundamentally um, like at a high level. It provides um, like two benefits. So it provides a benefit, direct benefit to you as an individual. Is like what whatever transactions you run on a Bitcoin, um, uh, like against Bitcoin, like whether you want to view a balance or whether you whether you want to. Um, um, like send, send Bitcoin, right? it's all going to be done from the privacy of your own node. So meaning that nobody else, no other actors on the in the Bitcoin um, ecosystem will have an insight into your transaction. Like it's all going to be done from your own node. So the second benefit that you provide as a Bitcoin node operator is to the entire network, meaning that you, whenever a um, like a new block is being broadcast, you you like your node is gonna receive that block and is gonna validate this block against the consensus rules, making sure that the block is valid. And if the block is valid, then it will reach it will retransmit or rebroadcast the block to the rest of the network. Thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Right, Reza, thank you for the quick and very detailed answer, Neski. Reza, would you like to ask a question? Hi, Happy New Year, guys. Uh, Wolf of Wall Street, you rule. Um, I'm excited about next year, but I was just wondering, do you guys think um, maybe we're going to have to go slow and steady for like six months to two years with like um, stable coins? And I, I noticed there were some carbon credits being offered in some of these new projects. Have you guys seen some of those? 
Um, I, I don't know what you guys think, but in my opinion, everything that's uh, not proof of work is not uh, not gonna stay. I I I I, I I'm a big big uh, proponent of proof of work. Um, I I generally don't understand how will ETH make the move to uh, proof of stake and how will that affect the network? Um, maybe I'm too dumb, but in my opinion, you have to work for it to uh, earn it. And just by allocating a part of your money doesn't mean you are actually doing any job or, or investing any resources for the security of the network. So um, I don't believe in all of these uh, carbon neutral uh, tokens and I see this is just a big big fad uh, that that's that's my two cents Judas on on this subject uh, Dennis Scott yeah if there's if you're interested in greening your Bitcoin uh, there will be some very interesting conversations happening soon I was fortunate to uh, meet a gentleman from the area that I live in who is writing a white paper on how to green your Bitcoin and it does not involve tokens it does not involve as a new asset creation. Um, and I think it's going to be a, an incredible breakthrough for the ESG people out there who are, you know, they value uh, protecting or, or uh, ensuring that the environment is protected via the mechanism of, you know, ensuring that carbon is reduced on the planet. And uh, I think that there's going to be an interesting approach that comes about because of it. I, I don't want to share too much of it because I'm doing a podcast with him on the 5th. And I'll, uh, I'll have that out. I, th I think that it's going to be a very interesting concept that guys like uh, Kevin O'Leary and all those others out there who are interested in ESG or green Bitcoin, uh, they're going to be able to find a way to unlock the $15 trillion in ESG funds to be able to buy Bitcoin, which is going to have an incredible price, incredible um, impact on the price of Bitcoin itself. So stay tuned for that episode to come out. I'm pumped to have it on uh, Smart People Shit soon. Uh, it's, it's actually very important. Just really quick, a uh, very important for people to realize is that fundamentally Bitcoin is fungible, meaning that it, like it doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter where you bought it, like where you bought it in New York, or where you bought it in South Africa, where you bought it in uh, in El Salvador. It doesn't really matter where you acquire Bitcoin, it's fungible. So meaning that in the future, you will be able to use that Bitcoin that you've acquired to conduct commerce globally. And the reason I'm saying it is that at a fundamental, there are three things need to happen for an individual to conduct commerce, so to purchase goods and services using Bitcoin. One is that they need to be able to sign a transaction using their wallet. Um, the second is that they need to be able to broadcast this transaction to the Bitcoin um, network. And the third is that there needs to be miner out there, a Bitcoin miner that includes their transaction in a block. When uh, all the three things happen, meaning that uh, like Bitcoin transaction is confirmed, you as an individual will, will be able to transact globally. The first two things, which is your ability to sign a transaction using your private key or using your wallet, is given to you because when you're in a possession, a physical possession of your Bitcoin, you can always sign a transaction using your hardware wallet. Nobody will prevent you from doing it. There is no actor out there that will come and say, don't do it. Yeah, and, 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 and that, that's what I meant when I said before, that it doesn't really matter how you mine your Bitcoin, as long as you mine Bitcoin efficiently and you earn on it, it's good. It's good for you. Obviously, the, the greener, not the greener, but the more efficient you get, then the more you earn and the better, obviously. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Reza. Thank you. And okay, putting three more people up. We have power up. Next up, we'll have Neo. Nice new movie. And Aya Zavik, you were here in the beginning and then you dropped on us. I hope you have your question now. So go ahead, power. Hey, uh, what's going on, everybody? Thanks for that question. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys if you can explain DeFi in layman's terms, right? Like, what are the benefits? What can I do with DeFi? Um, and specifically with Sovereign, like, can you just give like a, you know, like a one, two, three, like some of the key concepts of what benefits using DeFi on Bitcoin will do for me? Well, then, first of all, DeFi um, in general, uh, decentralized finance, right? So Bitcoin is, so to speak, a very uh, stupid coin, some would say. Uh, the only thing you can do with it is transfer it for from one address to another. 
uh, at the very basic of it. Obviously, today we have also have scripts and multisig and, and all kinds of uh, other stuff, but it's mostly about transferring Bitcoin from one address to another and storing it in various different manners. Um, these are the basic use cases of uh, Bitcoin today, which is amazing, obviously. Uh, um, it's without talking about the uninflation, uh, you know, not being inflation, inf inflatable, sorry, um, and all, all of the other characteristics of Bitcoin, right? Uh, but, you know, some people besides just holding Bitcoin and preserving their wealth, which again is a tremendous cause, and that's what we're all here for, and that's the most amazing uh, and, and, and important part of uh, what we're doing. Uh, but other than that, people also want to do some other stuff uh, with their money, right? Because today you don't just hold your money. You also take loans from time to time and you want to have credit cards and you want to you wanna trade your Bitcoin against something else. Now, it's, it's not really enough that you have a decentralized money um, of course, it's, a, again, a huge improvement uh, for the world uh, com in comparison to what we, we had so far uh, up until today in the world. But still, some of us would want to trade and, and sell Bitcoin for a, a, a representation of stablecoin of any kind, right? Um, so if we don't do this on a decentralized system, then it... it you, you don't uh, it, it's not it's less beneficial using a decentralized token right because you, no, no one assures you that tokens won't be freezed uh, and and defi what it comes to do it's bringing you all of this ecosystem and all of these tools to to interact and use your digital assets right like bitcoin like ethereum and more and more and more and what Sovereign is uh, doing is basically building this ecosystem on top of Bitcoin. So today, most of DeFi obviously is on ETH and other uh, blockchains which have uh, grown tremendously this year, um, like Solana and, and, and Polygon and more. But what Sovereign wants to do is do this all on top of Bitcoin. So Sovereign is layer two on top of Rootstock, uh, which is a merged mine Bitcoin sidechain. And, and Sovereign is a an EVM compatible, uh, sorry, Rootstock is an EVM compatible sidechain, which basically means that every project that you could, you see today on ETH can also run on Rootstock, right? Um, and that's what we're trying to do, basically. That's what, that's what we're doing step by step, um, building and bringing these applications from uh, the other blockchains in the ecosystem to Rootstock and to Sovereign. And, and basically enabling Bitcoin holders to uh, to to use their Bitcoins in the most decentralized way possible uh, when when doing things like taking loans, like trading, um, margin trading, soon perpetual swaps, um, soon zero uh, zero uh, fee loans, uh, zero interest loans. Sorry, um, and you know who knows what else in the future NFTs. Sovereign state, I don't know. I, I, I quickly just like to add on to that. I, I know Mike Brock's in the audience. I, I don't know if he's, you know, listening and wants to come up, but I mean, what, what they're trying to build with TV decks is, is amazing as a DeFi application for kind of bridging, uh, you know, fiat on and off. So Mike, if you're listening, I mean, maybe pop up here. It'd be a very fun conversation. You're more than invited to speak, Mike. Uh, I'd love to have you here on the stage. Um, Okay. So, so I have one more question. So just so I'm clear, right? Like you guys get technical and sometimes I just need things in layman's terms, right? So <laughs> one benefit with, on Sovereign, right? Would me be able to earn yield on my Bitcoin? I would be able to earn interest on my Bitcoin in a safe way. Is that correct? Correct. Now, when you say a safe way, obviously when you interact with Sovereign and not just with Bitcoin, you are... It's, it's more risky, obviously, than just interacting with Bitcoin because the Bitcoin base layer is the, the most secure. The, 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 it, it, it's set in stone. Whatever happens on the Bitcoin blockchain is, 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 is there forever, right? It's, it's unchangeable. Um, when, when you use Sovereign, you, 
obviously uh, take a bit more risks, right? Like, like obviously when you use uh, ETH or when you use WBTC or when you lose, use liquid BTC, you have to take some more security assurances because Bitcoin's main priorities uh, and the way the Bitcoin is built currently does not allow you to do this stuff natively on the Bitcoin blockchain. So what Rootstock does is it takes uh, um, a, a token called RBTC and for every Bitcoin that moves to the Rootstock blockchain, for every Bitcoin, the, the people want to move to the Rootstock blockchain, they uh, basically represent this with an RBTC. So you move your Bitcoin there and you get RBTC. Now, again, when you're doing this, there are all kinds of uh, risk and trade-offs that you are getting. Um, so you have more usability, more functionality, but you know more security assurance, assurances Sorry, uh, that you have to take. Um, and our goal, obviously, is to make this as seamless as possible. And ours and Rootstock's goal, obviously, is to make this as decentralized as possible. Um, and, and I know that they're working very hard right now on the pegout mechanism um, and, on, and on ways to improve it. So, so yeah, to, so to your question, when you use Bitcoin on other platforms, given it, if, it, if it's sovereign or WBTC or Liquid or Lightning, okay, you're always taking more assumptions. You're always taking more risks than interacting with Bitcoin's blockchain. As a final, as, a, as the bottom line, whenever you use Bitcoin outside of the Bitcoin blockchain, you always have trade-offs for the good and for the bad, but you always have to weigh your risks against what you're earning. Um, Neo, you go ahead next, and then Aya Zavik. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You touch on an important topic that uh, I actually want to ask you um, about the peg, okay? Mm -hmm. So it seems like the sovereign platform is very easy to peg in. So the past BTC, I think it's done uh, pretty quickly. However, it's not easy to peg out. So even in your sovereign wiki page, it says at this moment, the peg out is not as fast as the peg in. Fast BTC out will be available in Q1 2022. So I just was playing around with this and I transferred, you know, peg in some BTC. And, and I realized that to peg out is not as easy. So could you elaborate a little bit more on this? And what plans specifically do you have in mind for Q1 2022? Uh, yeah, definitely. So first of all, the pegout mechanism is one of the most important stuff for us to actually go out of uh, alpha and move to beta. Uh, so there are a, a bunch of stuff. Okay, so we're going to have in the next quarter or might take two quarters. Obviously, it doesn't depend just on us. But um, let's say in the next six months, uh, we're looking to have a brand new website. Um, the, it, the team is growing you know, day, day to day. Uh, so a lot of stuff are going to happen there. And the pegout mechanism, uh, based on, you know, uh, information that we're getting from uh, Rootstock, um, it should be ready, like you saw, in Q1 uh, 2022. Um, so once all of these stuff are ready, uh, we can safely, act, uh, you know, go out of alpha and move into beta. Um, and yeah, I think that answers the question. Uh, I don't know who was it was that I asked earlier for Mike to come up. And then we also got Scott back up here too. But uh, Mike, Brock, um, yeah. someone asked Welcome, a question Mike. directly towards him, right? Yeah, yeah but... he about the uh, DEXs and how do, uh, how do we interact. And perhaps, Mike, you can say a bit about what you guys are doing at uh, TBDEX. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, um... Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Actually, I tried to join a few times before, and I didn't realize the reason it wasn't letting me is because I didn't have microphone access turned on in Twitter. Um, but um, I don't know how many people have heard the podcast I did with the, um, you know, with the Tales from the Crypt crew yesterday. Uh, I give a good ninety-minute overview on TV decks and what we're working on. Um, so I'll try to summarize. Uh, quickly what what tv dex is and and then i would encourage people to go listen to that episode to get a sort of a more deep deep view um but 
you know, g- generally speaking, um, the TVDEX protocol is a, it's, it's a messaging protocol uh, for you know the the, the provisioning of, of liquidity um, in in markets that require social trust, and that's a kind of a big highfalutin way um, of saying that you know when you're trying to create decentralized markets of exchange between assets that um, one asset that's tr- that's trustless and one that's not like trustless, you need to be able to have a scheme by which like social trust can be modeled within the network. Um, what that means in practice is that <clears throat> the, sorry, um, that the um, users of this, this network um, have to negotiate a sort of a common set of, of, of sort of trust markers between themselves and, and the exchanging nodes um, to establish like uh, an exchange. So, I mean, I'm, trying to summarize really quickly and I know that I'm opening up a million cans of worms with every word that's coming out of my mouth but um, gen- I mean generally speaking um, that's the sort of the high level abstract uh, uh, you know description of what TVDEX is and, and what we're trying to accomplish All right. thank you very much and thanks for joining us uh, Mike I-, I also tried to add you a few times before <laughs> Uh, so I guess it was your mic uh, problem. Yeah, no, I, I didn't realize that it doesn't let you accept if you don't uh, have microphone access turned on in, in the privacy settings on your iPhone. So that was why it wasn't working. Okay, cool. Uh, cool. And uh, I will definitely listen to this podcast. I really love Marty and, and uh, Matt. And I, I, we asked them to join. I hope they will be uh, with us next time. We had um, a lot of fun. It was a fun podcast. Yeah, they, they, it's always fun there. Uh, they're both hilarious. Um Okay, so Aya Zavik, you're here from us since the beginning. First of all, thanks so much. No problem. <laughs> uh, no. Go ahead, buddy. Ask your question. It's really interesting what you guys are saying. So, you know, there's been so much discussed. So I'm going to switch my um, question slightly differently to what it was originally uh, meant to be because it's been answered in one way or another. So, look, uh, Sovereign, great um, product and token. It's currently right now two times the price it was at IDO, it, but it did go to nearly $80. I mean, it's dropped almost to you know 90%, minus 90% to what its all-time high was. Do you ever see it going back to that, or do you think it was because of the tokenomics and um, all of the very few number of distributions that were given out on private sale, which is why the price went to that level? Do you ever think it's going to return back to that? Um, in 2022, and how do you feel about it dropping, you know, minus 90 percent from its all-time high? Um, well, first of all, to be honest, I'm only in Sovereign for around three months. Joined uh, in the beginning of October, so yeah, it's it's gonna be three months right now. Um, it, I maybe I'll start with why did I join Sovereign? Um, because, <laughs> like I said before, I believe that we need a a decentralized financial system to to use Bitcoin. And I believe Sovereign is the closest thing that we, we have for this right now. And I came here to help spread the word about it and, the, and, and you know, let the world know about it um, in the way for Sovereign to become the, the biggest uh, and hopefully more, most decentralized uh, DeFi for Bitcoin system in the world. So do I think that the sovereign token price would go up? Yes. Uh, if we would do a good job, uh, then obviously I see the price going up. I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not really a, a big, I, I don't really understand much in tokenomics. Uh, I never invested in any uh, altcoins, you know, maybe a bit in the beginning of my Bitcoin journey, lost some money. And then ever since then, I've been 100% Bitcoin. Uh, Obviously, I lost a lot of money also because of that. I had many good opportunities that came by me, and I and, and I let them go. I just said, you know, leave me alone. I just want my Bitcoin in my hot in my hardware wallet. Uh, I don't want to get them out of there. They're 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 cold there, and they're fun. They love being cold. Um, so so yeah, without understanding anything in tokenomics, I do think that the sovereign price uh, would go up because um, I I I trust the sovereign community who, 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 who put up this uh, tokenomics and who voted and agreed on this tokenomics and everything and sovereign happens uh, on the bureaucracy uh, in a completely decentralized manner where everyone can share their vote and, and, uh, and, and influence. 
Um, and I, as soon as I joined uh, Sovereign, um, you know, they asked uh, how would I like to pay, get my salary, and, and you know, a, a, a wide chunk of my salary is paid in illiquid SOV, um, which is vested for two years, uh, like most of the team, by the way. So yeah, I do believe that the price will go up, and I um, I believe most of the team thinks so as well. Uh, I, I have never sold any uh, SOV that I received, uh, and I don't plan on doing this anytime soon. So um, I've got a question. So I'm not really familiar with Sovereign. My question was kind of answered just now, um, indirectly, because I was going to ask if the Sovereign token was pegged one-to-one to Bitcoin, kind of like how LBTC in the liquid sidechain is pegged mm-hmm. to to Bitcoin, but it sounds like Sovereign is like its own thing. Um, yep. Why is that so? Why not just do a one-to-one peg like Liquid? I'm, I don't, I don't get it. Sovereign. Okay, so let's let's put things in order. You don't have to you you, you don't have to touch the SOV token to use uh, Sovereign. Okay, so in order to use Sovereign, all you need is RBTC, which is Bitcoin on the rootstock uh, sidechain, um, and and SOV is merely the governance token. Um, for decision making and profit sharing from the sovereign uh, protocol. So sovereign is a DAO, right? We're not a company. We don't have any CEO. We don't have any offices. Uh, we don't have any bank account. All we have is uh, the DAO and uh, the smart contracts and the exchequer uh, who decides uh, on, on, on funds and, and such uh, stuff such as that. Um, so... Yeah, I think I lost myself a bit. I'm sorry, three hours. <laughs> it's getting harder. It's okay. I mean, the, the other way to say it, look, um, the, the coin Deep. has dropped minus 90%. That's, that's quite a considerable drop. And I'm just wondering whether there's any um, I don't think it was at $80. I, I don't think it was at $80 for such a long time. Maybe it was there for like a minute. Uh, Maybe a couple of days. It was there it, for a couple it, it of was days, there. but it was really? above, it was above fifty dollars for a considerable amount of time. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I honestly, I'm you know, not I think really... I think this is just I think it's such a really just a cautionary tale, mm-hmm. um, to avoid these these tokens. I mean, a DAO a governance token. I mean, that just kind of sounds like word salad. I, I I don't see any reason for a token to exist. Um, if you're wanting to do something. With Bitcoin, you can peg Bitcoin one to one into a side chain or into you know some other system that allows it to move more freely. But a tokenomics, I mean, come on, that that just sounds kind of scammy to me. Dia, yeah, I'd love to actually elaborate on that. So exactly what you're saying is is what Sovereign is. So in the same way that Liquid has L BTC, Rootstock has R BTC. It is the one to one peg, and you can interact on any of the applications on Sovereign without ever touching or without even knowing that the SOV token exists. So it really is that same sidechain liquid type model, except the SOV token represents the application layer that Sovereign has built. And that token probably initially was used to bootstrap funding to build, but then now it is also used to where the people that own that token can stake it in the protocol and have votes in governance, which you may think that's credible or not, but then also a share of the profits. So instead of somebody sending you know, funds into BlockFi and lending and, and borrowing against it in BlockFi, earning those fees, or sending it into Coinbase and trading on it in Coinbase, earning those fees. Sovereign has rebuilt those applications. You can use those applications without, again, ever touching the SOV token, but the fees are allocated to the SOV stakers. So it's an option. It, it, it kind of is like a quasi equity. And I know we'll get into kind of the SEC conversation and stuff like that, but hopefully that adds some clarity there. Yeah, so you're describing an unregistered security. I mean, that's kind of a concern for anyone holding a token, right? Well, I think there's actually, there's a YouTube video that uh, you may be interested in where, where Tone Vase, who is, is extremely knowledgeable on all of this, um, really kind of pushed on the legality against, um, you know, one of the core contributors, Yago. And I'm happy to kind of DM you that video. And, and, and I think you'll, you'll see in that video, it was one of the Swan um, Bitcoin Breakfast Club uh, episodes. And I think that'll answer a lot of your kind of questions about, what who takes a stance on the kind of sec stuff and you know obviously caveat emptor each person kind of make their own decision but there there was some intentionality and some rationale when, when sovereign was trying to build this to um make good faith efforts to avoid trying to do that um yeah 
I think that uh, it's something just important to note uh, you know, none of this exists in a vacuum. And if you loved the price of a company, even in the stock market or a project at a higher price, you should love it a hell of a lot more at a lower price. I mean, we see market wide drawdowns in crypto all the time, only to see two or three years later that those coins are up hundreds of thousands of percent. So it's sort of unfair, I think, sovereign or otherwise to zoom in and pretend just because this happened, coin happens to be down this amount at this certain amount of time that all of a sudden it's a bad investment or a cautionary tale. I mean, Amazon was down 95% and has had multiple drawdowns of over 50% and is the biggest company in the world. That's just the nature of markets. And as an investor in general, you should be somewhat indifferent to draw down like that because you should have a strategy where you're averaging down for the long term and looking for long term price appreciation. So I, I just think it's a bit unfair to cherry pick what is happening right now in a market that happens to be in this position because you're comparing it to the highest it ever was, not to the lowest it ever was. And there's a, a lot of ways to skin that cat. So I think that's just really important differentiation not just for this coin, uh, whether it's an unregistered security up to you or not, but just because something goes down doesn't mean the value is wrong. It just means someone might have to hold a little longer. Yeah, I don't think I don't think a drawdown is necessarily um, always a concern. Of course, I was very happy to get Bitcoin. Um, you know, March of 2020, we had 85 percent drawdown. Same. So I'm <laughs> that's not so much my concern. But when you're comparing this to like stake in Amazon, it's it's really different it's not the same. You have equity in a company. When you have the token, I mean, you guys mentioned a bunch of times you don't have to interact with the token. It was kind of used to bootstrap the funding for this project. So what that tells me is the token doesn't really have any reason to exist, again, other than raising funds, which is, you know, really not a very good model because, again, the folks that hold it, they don't have that equity in a company like you would when you buy Amazon stock. But they do have a, but they do have a say in how the company proceeds. And I'm not speaking specifically about sovereign. I'm speaking about the very nature of a DAO and, and government governance and decentralization, right? So, I mean, there may be a better way that we don't know, and I'm not defending or making a comment on it, but that is the very nature of DAOs and how these projects both fund and who gets to vote. So maybe there's a better system, but you can certainly understand why they would take this approach rather than going a centralized route and having a CEO, right? Yeah. It is it is centralized. It's 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 dino decentralized in name only. Come on, DAO's the LARP. I mean that's ridiculous. DAO, well, so in, DAO in what is... way would it be centralized? Um I mean I I know that there are plans to actually, you know, off well I I guess I'll pause there and, and say in what in what ways are is it centralized? Is it dino? I know most are, but I'm I'm curious to see examples. I just think um and, and this is also a question that I've asked myself, um, because as I said, uh, I've been a hardcore Bitcoin Maxi for uh, a few, uh, you know, a, a few good years now. Um, and I think DAO is getting decentralized as time moves on, right? As, ta as time goes, the DAO will have to become more decentralized, otherwise it will just fail. Um, and that's the same thing that uh, I think happens with Sovereign or with any other DAO, right? So in the beginning, obviously, the voting power, most of the voting power will be in the hands of uh, the people who started the project because they're the ones who must believe it and they're the ones who hold most of the tokens, right? Um, but with time and as time goes on, this this voting power and these tokens are getting distributed. And if, if the system really does something well, then people would actually want to buy the tokens because then they could actually be a part of the decision making they could be a part of the profit sharing and if if you want to make this company if, if you want to make products that will compete with existing uh existing companies then that's the only uh, way you can do this right now you if you want to make a competitor to uniswap you there's no other way to do this uh, if it's not a DAO. like 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 uh david said you can do a centralized company but what's the What's the, the, the benefit over a DAO here? So I, I, I don't think it's like total, again, black or white here, decentralized or not decentralized. And obviously it's not as decentralized as Bitcoin. Like we said, when you use other stuff that are not Bitcoin, you're taking more security assurances. And you probably, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, someone to put their entire house on Bitcoin, like, uh, sorry, on Sovereign, like I would recommend people to put their entire house on, on, on uh, Bitcoin, right? Uh, one has already proved itself tremendously well. 
uh, and the other is fairly young. Uh, but that's the thing with investments, and that's the thing with taking risks. The more the the, the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward could get. Um, and and DAOs are very risky. Obviously, uh, it's a very new technology. It's a very new uh, experiment. We can call it. Uh, and I I agree uh, and I, I understand your suspicions and and it, you know being so acceptable and and not being suspicious is actually a a, a worse thing than than suspecting it because m- probably most of the DAOs will be scams and most of the uh, shit coins will be scams like we know uh, up until today but uh, if you do things right then yes like Amazon was one out of a thousand uh, com- I, I, you know like like one of each thousand companies survived the dot-com bubble and in 2008 and each bear market, then yeah, uh, DAOs will be the same and there will be some who will be good that will be uh, good to stay at. Yeah, but, but the pro- yeah, the problem there, I think, uh, with, with what you said, and I'm not disagreeing. I think that, uh, listen, it's, we're in our infancy. We're just scratching the surface and DAOs are certainly not the end game for how decentralization is going to operate. I agree a hundred percent with all of that, but I also think it's, you have to be very cautious of just saying everything that doesn't succeed is a scam, right? Like every company that didn't succeed in the dot-com bubble wasn't a scam. They were entrepreneurs who were trying something and failed, but advanced the ball of technology and entrepreneurs. So people love to talk about the dot-com bubble as a corollary for what's happening in crypto, as if it's a bad thing. The dot-com bubble gave us the biggest and most important companies of our generation, right? And so just because a lot of these things may go to zero, they may fail, that's just because people are trying to innovate and most innovators and most companies fail. But every single one of them will have their successes, they will advance the ball, and they will help us end up having this future that we want. So I think that like, just in general, maybe I'm a half glass full type of person, but I think we should cheer on anybody who's giving a legitimate effort to try, even if you don't necessarily agree with the way that they're trying to do it, because at the end of the day, I think they're all going to help. I just hate like how often we throw around the word scam just because the price of something goes down or it doesn't succeed. I think that's really, really unfair. Yeah. I mean, look, with all due respect, I've kind of been asking some questions that I didn't really know anything about sovereign when I entered this room. But, um, you know, with all due respect, when when you ask people just direct questions about what they're doing, um, sometimes they sort of dig their own grave, if you will. So I didn't know that the Sov token existed. That for me is my biggest red flag. And um, you mentioned that it was used to to bootstrap funding for the company. That's a huge red flag because it is you know, heavily distributed and a pre-mine that's given to the founders. And then because it's a so-called DAO, the token is a governance token, meaning (laughs) the people that pre-mined it and gave it to themselves that have the governing rights because it's not distributed um, across the people. So, I mean, with all due respect, the whole governance token thing is, is really a LARP. So you have sort of a Rube Goldberg machine that doesn't really need to exist, but you've created a reason why it exists. And that's really the essence of a, of a DAO. I think, you know, people kind of ran out of ideas after the ICO craze. And in the like wake of that, it's like, well, what can we do that would give our token legitimacy? And so everyone started creating DAOs and um, they really are very concerning to me. And I, I, <laughs> I don't really know what to say other than I'm just getting red flags left and right. And um, my suspicions have have definitely been more or less confirmed as a result of this call. Um, okay, I wish uh, in my all uh, really long honesty, I wish I Yago. Oh, Yago is here back. Wow, Yago. <laughs> Yago, you came on time. Um, I, okay, you probably haven't heard. Um, the plus plus uh, li- recent comments, and I'm not sure you can really answer. Um, but she has some brought some good concerns and questions regarding uh, sovereign tokenomics, and she thinks uh, DAOs are basically a fad, uh, and dinos decentralized in name only. Uh, and I'd love to for you to explain it. Um, as eloquently as you usually do. Sure. So Bitcoin um, is a a totally unique asset, which has been, um, you know, it it is structured to be a monetary asset. And as a monetary asset, you want it to be completely uh, neutral 
and almost totally unchanging. Um, but we also would like to bring uh, an economy to exist around Bitcoin. And um, for, you know, one of, the, one of the key things which I think makes Bitcoin attractive is permissionless access, uh, global access, uh, the fact that it's borderless. And I think this is important, not just in terms of financial inclusion, but also in terms of being able to uh, match the worlds that we are rapidly moving into further and further, which is a borderless digital world. Now, today, if you want to be involved uh, as a group in economic activity, the way you do it is you register yourself uh, as a corporation or as an LLC, and um, you're governed by the courts of a particular country. Their jurisdiction is limited to that country. Um, you are um, limited to the standards uh, of those courts, um, and uh, you are subject to the regulations of those of those countries. And that, that introduces, uh, in many ways, censorship, which um, doesn't work with what we're trying to do if we're trying to build decentralized systems or build on top of decentralized systems. So, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been working in the Bitcoin space. Um, my, you know, for three previous companies in the space um, two of them were regulated and, um, I hated it. It was, um, it was, uh, you know, a constant, uh, effort to ask permission to do the things that we wanted to do while what we were wanting to do was build in a permission of space. So, uh, I took a great deal of interest when, um, I started seeing some of the first uh, DAOs being developed. And DAOs, as an idea, are a creation of the Bitcoin community. You know, it was the Bitcoin community and Bitcoin talk forums back early in 2011 that, that started discussing how we can introduce um, uh, different types of structures that would be uh, governed by and ultimately secured by the ultimate court of, of Bitcoin, right? So the Bitcoin proof of work system. Um, and we started to see probably the, um, the, the first real examples of this, not in the Bitcoin ecosystem itself, but I think it's extremely amenable to the Bitcoin ecosystem and to building e an economy around uh, Bitcoin. So I think basically, in my view, the way we get to hyper-Bitcoinization is not by turning Bitcoin into the only asset. Um, or the only decentralized asset, but in creating a whole set of assets and a whole set of ways of organizing ourselves into institutions which um, use Bitcoin as the primary uh, reserve asset and continue this Satoshi's mission of creating new territories for freedom and a new borderless and inclusive world by... Uh, uh, by creating institutions which are not governed by uh, uh, the, the courts of laws of, of geographic jurisdictions and their regulations. And I think the only way we do that is through DAOs. Um, and so, you know, with Sovereign, for example, there's been a lot of thoughts that has gone into uh, how can you um, take decentralization very, very seriously, but not decentralization in the way that Bitcoin is decentralized, which is, you know, it, Bitcoin is designed to be a vetocracy, right? In other words, uh, 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 that's from the word veto. It's designed that it's almost impossible for any party to introduce changes. Sovereign's designed with a different design goal. It's designed to allow stakeholders to make more rapid changes because it's higher up the stack. It's application level. It's not money. And I think different use cases, you need to rethink um, w w w 
what is the the governance system? What is the institution you're trying to build and builds the system which open and inclusive, but will uh, achieve the the design goals for your use case. I think she D plus plus kind of keeps coming up and off stage. I imagine she's having some sort of connection issue. Okay, in the meanwhile, um, but David, you, did you want to jump Brad in, buddy? With us yeah. Here. Hey, Brad. Or Brad? Yeah, I think we're kind of the internet here is gonna turn a bit crazy. Uh, someone has a delay or something, so I'll just shut up for a bit. <laughs> Well, I, I'd be curious if Dee could kind of maybe bring her questions back up again, because I, I, I think when she kind of initially asked them was right before Iago had, had, had joined. Um, I can try to recap them if Dee can't speak. Sure. Hey there. Um, I'm, actually, I'm actually driving currently, so I'm just listening at this point. Okay. Uh, well, I think some of the questions, um, Yago, if maybe you want to elaborate on is like, um, you know, specifically as it pertains to, to Sovereign, kind of like the initial pre-mine, so to speak, right? And what was the point of having a token? And what powers do token holders actually have? Um, some of that conversation may be insightful to listeners. Well, the, uh, the, the, the reason that you have a token... Uh, Basically, the two reasons uh, which are tied to each other. One is you want to have a set of stakeholders who have skin in the game uh, and give those stakeholders the ability to collectively make decisions because you want to be able to make decisions with some degree of frequency. Uh, basically, that's the point of governance. And then if you're going to demand of them skin in the game, you also need to reward them for that. And so you need to incentivize them to have skin in the game. This is not that different from, um, you know, what equity uh, represents. I mean, if you think about what the corporation is, right? Corporations were invented as a mechanism to allow... Uh, large numbers of uh, people to deploy significant amounts of capital together to accomplish tasks which uh, otherwise would be impossible to accomplish. And the first examples were extremely ambitious indeed, right? Uh, you know, probably the first significant example of a corporation was the Dutch East India Company, which was designed for the colonization and uh, development of trade uh, uh, with, uh, you know, Southeast Asia. Um, these were very, very difficult, very, very innovative and very, very uh, 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 significant and ambitious challenges. And you needed to be able to get a whole bunch of people to take on significant risks together and coordinate their efforts. And so that was the reason that the corporation was uh, invented. Um, now, you know, it, that's just one type of institution which is designed for um, coordinating large numbers of people who, who probably don't know each other. Right. And Bitcoin is another example of an institution which is designed to coordinate the efforts of very, very large numbers of people. But it's not designed to be um, um, and it has, you know, it also has its own token and it requires skin in the game in the form of uh, significant investment in hash power. And it provides a reward uh, to incentivize that in the form of Bitcoin. So um, so the, the basic principle here is you want to have a vested uh, group of stakeholders deeply invested in building out the project and you need to incentivize them to do that and um and so that's that's why sov has a token it's what we call a coordination token because governance is only one part of it the ultimate goal is the coordination of the community around the ability for the community to choose 
uh, you know, which stable coins to allow into the system because of the level of risk that they might introduce, which products uh, or what lending rates to introduce or various things like that. Uh, so so that, that, that's the purpose of the SOV token. Yago, I'd be kind of curious to hear your opinions about a few things here, since we're really squarely stuck on the topic of talking about sovereign um, and whether it will be the Bitcoin DeFi that all of the DeFi folks are hoping it can be. Um, but a couple things here would be, one, do you think that sovereign can survive um, even in, in, an, in a uh, highly negative regulatory environment, for instance, in might be the United States? but it could be somewhere else. I think one of the biggest calls for those in the Ethereum camp or those that are working on extremely decentralized or by their points, they believe Ethereum to be decentralized enough to survive some sort of a nation state attack. Do you think that Sovereign could sit in that same camp? That Do you think it's decentralized enough in order to survive some sort of nation state or a highly negative regulatory environment where users are essentially, you know, could be here in America, could be in another country, could be in Nigeria, could be, um, Afghanistan, are they able to use the product even when it's not legal or borderline illegal to do so? Um, I think yes. So, you know, we, 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 haven't, uh, we haven't had to test that theory yet, but there's over 13,000 addresses that are staking uh, SOV. That, now, staking SOV is not just holding SOV, it's a significant um, uh, investment in terms of you, you lose liquidity of your SOV for a significant amount of time and the reason they do this is because it allows them to participate in the governance and to earn fees um, and and so we see also a very very high level of, of uh, collaboration now uh, uh, introducing any significant changes into the sovereign protocol requires um, either a simple majority or a super majority um, of those SOV stakers. A and the most significant things like, w w which would be, for example, the ability to um, blacklist addresses, for example, is something that you might want a government, a government might want, right? The blacklisting addresses, um, or uh, moving funds, uh, uh, or, or, or changing basically anything that requires a, a change of the contract itself, right? Requires a supermajority. Uh, it's now now in addition to that, of those thirteen thousand stakers, they are from all over the world. We know this just the basis of sort of the IP addresses that we can see that are connecting to the system, but they're all pseudonymous. And there's no particular address that has uh, more than about 3.8% uh, of the voting power. So I think it would be extremely difficult uh, you know, like let's say uh, I, I think probably of all the people involved in the sovereign community, I would be the most likely to be targeted just because I've been very vocal. So let's say the SEC sent me a letter, right? And they said, uh, uh, you know, here's a cease and desist letter. Uh, you could get arrested or, we will, or they even arrest me. Um, and then uh, they, they, they use this to try and pressure me uh to, to to make a change and so right and i buckle under the pressure i can't i you know i i don't want to go to jail i don't definitely don't want to go to federal jail um so i i i i buckle the question is what can i do right at best i can ask the community to make the change that the sec is asking for uh in order to save my hide and maybe at that moment, I'm hoping that the community agrees, but frankly, I don't think they would. And, uh, and so I, I think, yes, I think uh, sovereign to a great extent, uh, maybe to a complete extent already, is uh, immune to such pressures. All right. 
Um, yeah, I really need you. <laughs> wanted you, Yaga, to be here and explain all this stuff. Um, so I hope that answered uh, most of the uh, D++ plus plus, uh, question um, regarding Sovereign. Yeah, see, we have Brad Mickelson uh, who joined us. Um, he's doing a great job marketing at eToro, um, previously at BlockFi. Uh, thanks for joining us. You're welcome to introduce yourself, uh, as well as Matt uh, C., Cybersecurity analyst, good to have you with us. Um, okay, uh, if if you guys are still down for it, you know there are a lot of people who want to ask their questions. Uh, so so long as you guys are here, I'm gonna bring up uh, two three more. So we have Yedidia, Usman. Opa. Oh, can't put more people. Sorry. Yeah, Didier, do you want to ask your question? Or Usman, go ahead, guys. Shoot. Hi, hi, my friends. Hello, I'm uh, from Israel. Uh, my name is uh, Yedidia. Uh, it's fun, it's uh, space. Uh, thank you, thank you, my friends. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, Usman, do you have a question? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I am in crypto, especially Bitcoin and other. I um, try to, you know, diversify my portfolio, but mainly in good coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, things like that. So now, Bitcoin. And after the, you know, the upgrade, um, I know that this program ability is going to come into Bitcoin. Uh, my question is, are we going to see something, uh, smart contracts that are, in, I mean, like, you know, adopted by Bitcoin in larger scale? I hope so. That's basically what we're trying to do with Sovereign, right? So, uh... There, there are a lot of competitors for building um, platforms for smart contracts for Bitcoin. Um, most of them do not interact, uh, I would say, directly with uh, BTC. Um, there are some very basic smart contracts. Uh, I don't know if you can call it smart contracts or scripts you can do at Bitcoin. But, uh, but yeah, you know, trading, lending, uh, swaps, margin trading, perpetual swaps. We, that's that's basically all of the stuff we're trying to build and 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 the way to do this in a decentralized manner is is with smart contracts um so obviously obviously the the world is going there right uh, and like i said before bitcoin itself is pretty stupid uh, and to make it work uh, we have to create the tools and the smart contracts uh, to be able to trade it in a decentralized manner yeah, sorry. I was saying that if it is adapted, and today we know Ethereum is just like, you know, out of touch today because of this gas fees, uh, there are multiple solutions, but it's still like way out of the, you know, um, things special for small investors, right? And once this sm smart contracts adopted by Bitcoin in larger scale, as I said, in, and as you actually also described, then if that goal is reached, are we going to see um, somewhat minimum fees in terms of, you know, uh, gas fees? Uh, so I, I think the I question is about scalability. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. So with regards yeah. to scalability, with regards to scalability, the, you cannot scale uh, you cannot scale smart contract platforms um, where you're doing the computation on chain. Uh, I think, remark, it's crazy to me that not everyone understands this yet. Like, you know, like people talk about the scalability of Solana, but Solana has already broken down a few times. Uh, it was offline for 17 hours. And it's only just getting started in terms of you know, I mean, we're, we're very, very early in terms of 
the actual use cases being run on these systems. Uh, Ethereum, you know, has become extremely exclusive in terms of who can use it, like you mentioned. Um, so the old way people thought about scaling was sharding, and that's what you know the uh, the Ethereum merge is all about. It's what Polkadot is all about. Um, but sharding isn't uh, isn't really a good scaling mechanism either, um, because it, it it it's just you know replicating layer ones. What you really need to do is you need to take the computational complexity out of the layer one and do computations off chain and then secure those computations by proving them on chain. And that's what rollups do. Um, and it's what Lightning Network does. So if you think about the way Lightning Network works, you perform a whole bunch of transactions, you collect these uh, cryptographic receipts, and then you can present the last cryptographic receipt with the last uh, uh, um, balance to the blockchain. So you've done a thousand transactions, but you're only presenting one receipt. Zero knowledge proofs do something similar for smart contracts. And so what we're doing with Sovereign is we're basically rolling up these two technologies, right? We're using zero knowledge proofs uh, to prove computation off chain and we're using Lightning Network to prove transactions of chain. Um, and that's, I think, how we scale. Uh, in fact, I know that, like, if we can't scale that way, we can't scale it all, right? But it, we, we, we know we can scale um, using those methodologies. And so, um, you know, that's going to be another six months, maybe a year, of work to get that really, really clean. Although the, the, the you know, Lightning Network is already uh, integrated. We're already starting to uh, use rollups and testnet. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, but that, that will effectively give us uh, infinite uh, scalability. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, because of some other, uh, you know, partially because, you know, there are not as many transactions being done in Ethereum due to other design choices that we've made, uh, uh, fees already are, are quite low. But ultimately, I think we can get to a point where, where fees are basically too, too cheap to meet you. All right. Uh, Osman, I hope that answered your questions. Um, I think we're going to do like three last questions and then wrap it a night. Um, I, I'd love, you know, doing this more. Jeff Dorsey just popped in, didn't even uh, went up the stage to say hi, just exploded the spaces, brought us uh, a thousand more people here. So thank you, every, everyone, for joining. Uh, if you still haven't done so, please follow us here on Twitter. Uh, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and join our Discord community. Uh, just go to our website, sovereign.app, scroll to the bottom and uh, find the Discord link. You can find everything you need on Discord. You can ask every question you'd like. Um, this is also where we do our bi-weekly community meetings. Uh, so you can uh, join and get updated and ask questions every, you know, from, for the, from the first source, as they say, uh, every two weeks. Uh, so we'd love to have you there. Um, it's been an amazing space. And I really thank you, everyone who's joined, our speakers, our listeners, uh, I, we're going to do, uh, I think, like I said, if our guests are, are down for it, three last questions. Uh, and then I think we're going to wrap it night. And I'm very positive that we're going to do this again sometime soon. So we have Mohammed up next. Afterwards, Charles and Brad.id, you will be the one to wrap it night. Um, so go ahead, Mohammed. Hi. Thank you for... Uh letting me having the chance and I would like to say uh, Happy New Year to everyone before it comes the time and I would like to send a positive message to everyone that Bitcoin was made to rise and Bitcoin is there to make a big change in the world as uh, the Dr. Sebastian Amos explained in his book The Bitcoin Standard uh, which made a, a great impression on uh, Michael Saylor and many investors around the world. Personally, I am really, really uh, holding my coins 
and I'm not selling. And uh, keep it up, guys. And thank you for letting me join the space. And I appreciate it. Thank you. And if you have any question, I can answer. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for joining us, Mohammed. Um, okay, Charles, you want to ask your question? Uh, just to speak to something, you know, positive. Thank you very much. This is my first time on your space, but as a uh, you know PR specialist, I'm really um, you know believing the in the the market. And just to say that you know, press is the most valuable service that a crypto company should invest in right now. And with the message you know that you're presenting, this is such a merging industry. You know, there's so many companies, you know, they're swimming in cash and but they still need the credibility, you know, within, you know, getting that mainstream media. So to really, you know, build that trust, you know, like you're working on, you know, between the the system uh, and all the currencies that really build that solid trust and have that get that public acceptance. And that's really something I know that the industry really needs to get that level of public adoption that it needs. So this is something I think we should really, you know, consider. And if anybody wants to speak more about that, you know, I'm av I'm available. Well, Charles, if you want to help Sovereign out with that, uh, you, you feel free to DM me. Yeah, we'll definitely will do. Thank you very much. Well, guys, I got to bounce out of here in just a moment. Um, I I really want to say thank you to Yago for inviting me. Uh, to be a part of this space. Um, uh, also to Sovereign for putting it on. I look forward to you guys continuing to, you know, work through that entrepreneurial spirit and build Sovereign into something that is uh, adopted across the planet. If you're interested in connecting with me, I know with this space turned towards a highly focused towards Sovereign as it should have. It's your space. Um, but we talked about a lot of different things today. Um, one of those that's very important to me in particular is the political realm. So I'm working really hard to get members of Congress to protect the crypto and Bitcoin space. Um, I'm going to be helping Erica Rhodes take out Brad Sherman. Uh, and I'm also going to be working on uh, making sure the crypto mining, Bitcoin mining infrastructure industry stays in the USA. Uh, I'll likely be speaking at a conference in Texas about that. Uh, but also in Sacramento, I'll be there and I'll be in Chicago in January. So if you're in any of those cities, hit me up. I'll be around and I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we haven't announced it yet, Dennis, but we're going to meet you very, very soon in January. So stay tuned, guys. Uh, we're going to be with him again very, very soon. So thank you very much for joining us, Dennis. And uh, because of promise and I'm a of my word, uh, we had one last question. Brad, I oh, you just disappeared. Buddy, I want to let you answer, you know, ask your question, but you're making this very hard on me. Okay, I, I think we're going to wrap it tonight unless Brad is going to uh, magically uh, rejoin us. Um, Iago, could, some final words? I could substitute for a last question if that's all right. Yeah, no, I think here Brad is Brad is here. So, okay, let's uh, let him have his final question like I promised. Sorry, just like to keep my word all good yeah brad go ahead buddy oh uh, sorry my my uh twitter keeps crashing for some reason it's done it like six times i'll try to make this quick before it crashes again i wanted to voice my frustration um with d plus plus i've seen her unfortunately she's not here anymore i don't like to talk behind somebody's back but i get frustrated she comes on places and she says things like oh that sounds like word salad to me and uh, it sounds scammy and, you know, this sounds like an opinion and it, she's not speaking, she's not asking questions specifically about something. I mean, to me, it sounds like she automatically says, oh, this is a scam and, and, but she doesn't understand it. When you say that sounds like word salad to me, it sounds like she doesn't understand it. And, but rather than ask questions to try to understand it better, we're talking about sovereign in this case, in this case. She, you know, she just kind of like, it sounds like FUD to me. She's throwing out FUD. And I've seen her do this on other spaces, and it, it, it frustrates me to no end. Comes on, throws some FUD, and then she leaves. Um, not always leaves, but anyway. Um, so I listened to the Sovereign discussion that Iago had with Tone Vays, and I thought that was very good. Tone asked some uh, very pointed questions, specific questions that were, you know, asking about how, how it works and stuff like that. And I, I still would like to learn more about how Sovereign works, but we'll, we'll have to, you know, I'll have to ask those, those questions at a later time. 
But anyway, I just wanted to fr voice my frustration with D++. I think I'd just like to add, because maybe maybe I feel like I've been in her position not a long time ago. Um, so I think, you know, part of this Bitcoin Maxi cancel culture, um, t to me specifically, uh, I kind of felt like that's the, the, the best way and best approach for me, because uh, like I said before, in the very beginning of my Bitcoin journey, I, I put some money in some shit coins and, and, and lost in terms of Bitcoin, lost about 75% of my of my uh, initial investment. So uh, when 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 starting looking at Bitcoin, you know, backwards, and when, it kind of made much more sense to just ignore everything that's not Bitcoin because in the beginning I was so like optimistic. Yeah, everything is gonna be on the blockchain and songs and 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 I I, I don't know movie tickets and and party and events. You name it, everything is going to be on the blockchain. That was the beginning. That was the dream. And and then as as soon as you start learning more and more about this about this world and about the reality, it seems like Bitcoin is the only true viable uh, solution. Uh, and this may and then it's very easy to, to 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 go down this rabbit hole of Bitcoin maximalism and just canceling everything else that is not Bitcoin and purely and one hundred percent decentralized. But I think that if you are a thinking person who is able to re-evaluate his opinion uh, from time to time, not just getting stuck in what you thought was right uh, a year ago. So you have to look at the market, right? And you have to look at stuff happening. And, and, you, uh, and you have to see that being a Bitcoin maximalist is not so good for you, right? Not financially and not um, in terms of, of what can you actually do uh, with your Bitcoin. So I think what I learned in this past few years is that decentralization is not a black or white uh, thing. It's uh, it's a spectrum and, and something can start not as decentralized and become more decentralized with time. Obviously, Bitcoin was this as well. It wasn't that decentralized in the beginning, right? When there was only one or two miners. Um, so, so that's the nature I would say of big, uh, big changes like that, and and I, I think it's only natural, right? Um, yeah, I think that was a very good question to end. And Mike, maybe you'd like to add something on that? Yeah, I was just going to um, just chime in a little bit because I've been doing a lot of thinking about the whole conversations around decentralization and Bitcoin maximalism and and a multi coin future and. And I think like one of the, the things that's really occurred to me as I've tried to sort of sort through, you know, these arguments that are happening is one, I think people are talking past each other. And because I think most, not maybe, maybe not most, but like, I think some of the loudest voices in the room and, and especially people who are very close to the crypto community, I think come to these technologies through a very political lens. And if I had to guess, and D++ isn't here to, to speak for herself, um, but, you know, I looked at her profile and I think she, you know, she uh, identifies as a, like a cypherpunk and I think like an anarchist. And so I assume that she comes to this through the lens of like the purpose of crypto is to bring the state down and to achieve a stateless society of um, voluntarism or whatever it is. And so, like, I, I think like that's kind of actually like what's going on when you're having a lot of these conversations is there's this sort of sense that like Bitcoin is a tool to bring about the political goals that I have. Um, and I think within the decentralized finance community more general, I think you kind of go into a, a far more, um, you know, moderate middle of people who I think may, may share some of those goals, but also have, I think, a lot more sort of pragmatic um, um, ends in mind. Um, that, you know, like, and I think I would, count you can, you can say that. it, you can, you, you, yeah, I mean, I mean, but usually those are commercial ends, right. Or maybe even speculative ends, right. Uh, yeah, and I, I, and I'm comfortable saying that my purpose in crypto is, is not like to bring down the state. Like that's not actually, like, I mean, I know there's many, many of my crypto friends that is their goal, like very explicitly, including some people who work at Square, like they want, they would like to see like an end to the U.S. government and a move towards like an anarchist, voluntary, contractual space society. And they see Bitcoin as like a very, very critical sort of like tool in, in that. And 
I'm not bought into that, like philosophically, but like that is, I think that when you, when we get down to it, like a lot of maximalism is, is really steeped in that sentiment. I, I agree. And I think, you know, people like D++, you know, I, I only joined the, to hear the tail end of what you were saying, but, you know, I, I think I got, got the gist, but I, I appreciate it. I think that there is a high degree of skepticism that we need to have um, about any effort uh, uh, in the space um, because, you know, it has been a place where people have taken advantage of the fact that uh, you can, you know, invent your own money, skip all of the difficult parts of making money and just go straight to the making money part. And then <laughs> trade it for other people's made up money, um, and uh, and a lot of the a lot of the space has looked like that. And so I think it's very very legitimate to come with a skeptical uh, perspective. I think where things have been getting stuck for the Bitcoin community over the last few years is that very frequently they haven't been willing to uh, explore beyond that at all. And there's clearly been a huge amount of innovation that has occurred uh, in the space outside of Bitcoin. Um, you know, stable coins, uh, decentralized, or what used to be decentralized stable coins in the form of MakerDAO, uh, DAOs, uh, various use cases around gaming. Uh, some of them are very, very, uh, uh, are only prototypes at this point, or maybe proofs of concept is at best. But, um, but they're very significant use cases which uh, are gaining traction. And, and, and some of them are very, very important use cases, you know, to fundamentally how we want to use Bitcoin, even just as simple money, right? Our ability to transact with Bitcoin, to trade with Bitcoin, to borrow and lend against Bitcoin uh, without need for intermediaries is crucial to being able to use Bitcoin without giving up the core property of Bitcoin which is that you you don't need to have an intermediary. So so you know I think there's a battle currently going on in the Bitcoin space, and I think things are shifting where people are um, re uh, rediscovering the sense of uh, excitement, innovation, and adventure that Bitcoin had earlier on. Uh, and I'm very very excited about that. I you know I think. Mike, what you guys are doing at TBD is a very big part of it. And, you know, if I, uh, I think the, 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 this idea of creating a, a more decentralized on-ramp, off-ramp protocol is, is crucial if we want to, to be able to avoid the need for forcing people uh, to have, you know, an on-ramp and off-ramp experience uh, limited only to intermediaries. Yeah, I, I agree with that, right? And I just, like, my point isn't to over, like, try and overly, like, politicize this. I think there's, like, 10 different conversations that, that people are having. I agree with everything you say. Like, I, I think that from the perspective of, um, you know, a lot of this innovation that we're having, uh, someone made the point that, like, you know, zero knowledge proofs came out of, like, Ethereum. And, and obviously, like, that's, like, something, you know, if you heard our podcast I was on yesterday with uh, the, the Tales from the Crypt folks, I mean, that, that's like an important technology that's playing into the decentralized identity, um, you know, projects that, that we're working on. And like, you know, further to the point, you know, I think that, you know, the, there's, there is like, I think a real, I think you're alluding to this. There's, there, there has, has been a lot of like bad projects out there that have, have left a lot of bad tastes in a lot of people's mouths. Um, and I think, you know, there's also a truth there that I think a lot of these projects that have failed and will fail um, are are steeped in good intentions that the people behind them are trying to, you know, really like build something that that will that will have a passive positive outcome. Not all of them. And some of them, some of these people are engaging in pump and dump schemes or, or rug pulls. And uh, there's a lot of this going on. And it's and I, and I think the, the analogy to, you know, the 1999 you know, dot com bubble bursting is, is very apt because it's the same thing. There's people see there's a lot of money now being made in this. And so you have literally everyone rushing into it. You have bad people rushing into it, good people rushing into it, people who have 
a little bit of knowledge, but not that much, just enough to be dangerous. And they're starting these projects and they haven't really fully thought them through. The game theory is broken. The incentives are wrong. Um, and everything kind of like blows up. And it's just like everything and in, in, in everything under the sun um, is what we're seeing happening right now. And there's going to be shakeouts. Like, like the vast majority of projects are not going to succeed. Um, and that's okay. Um, and to your point, there's a lot of innovation that's actually happening. And, and, and some of those, some of even those failed projects, right, will have ideas that they contribute that will find their way back into um, other successful projects. And I think that's kind of the, the morass that we're in right now. 100%. Well said. Um, well, uh, I think that was a great way to close it. Um, almost four hours, guy. Really, it's, it's an amazing space. I, I must shout out um, to the person who practically made this all happen, Magnus from our marketing team. Uh, he was the one behind the scene. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I hope you're not asleep and you're here. Is <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for setting this all up. Uh, thanks to all of our guests. Uh, we had so many people tonight here on the stage, uh, Iago and Mike and Dennis and Scott and Alco and Daly were with us before and Missing Crypto and um, I, I probably forgot, I'm sorry, uh, it's been uh, so long, uh, but uh, Aaron Van Weerdem, uh, obviously. Uh, thank you very much, all of you guys who joined, um, all the listeners, obviously, um, Thank you for everyone who's supporting Sovereign. Uh, thank you for making this year so amazing. Um, stay Sovereign. Uh, Iago, some final remarks? Thanks, everyone. This has been awesome. Um, I was glad that I could come back for the tail end. Uh, and yeah, definitely. Stay Sovereign, everyone. See you in the new year. Let's make it uh, as awesome as this one was. <laughs>